R. E. Lee, A Biography, Volume 2, Chapters 24 through 28. Written by Douglas Southall Freeman. Published by Charles Scribner's Sons, New York and London, 1934. Digitalization by Bill Thayer. Audiobook produced by Open Audio Recordings and read by Nancy, a Microsoft Azure AI Neural Voice. Chapter 24, My Desire Has Been to Avoid a General Engagement. The Second Battle of Manassas. The road to the eastward led to Jackson's position on the morning of August 29, 1862, but south of that road, nine miles away, lay Warrington, where Pope, by the latest report, had a large force. A Confederate column marching eastward to Groveton by way of Haymarket would expose its right flank to an attack from Warrington and must guard itself accordingly. Cavalry was needed for this purpose, and as Lee had none, he had to improvise them. Fortunately, during the early morning, a detached cavalry company rode into the lines at Thoroughfare Gap. Lee took this company, collected all available mounted men from the different commands, placed them under Stuart's quartermaster, Major Samuel H. Hairston, who happened to be with the infantry, and sent them off, 150 strong, to ascertain if any Federals were still in the vicinity of Warrington. Before Hairston could set out, the infantry were on the road. Hood's division was in advance, and picked Texas riflemen acted as skirmishers. Contact was soon established with the rear guard of the Federals who had held the gap the night before, but they fled fast and soon disappeared altogether. The steady tramp of Longstreet's regiments was uninterrupted. The dust was thick and the air already hot by the time Haymarket was reached and passed. A pleasant rolling country, half pastoral, half agricultural, was opening before the army. From high points a wide and inspiring panorama was spread out. At intervals green forests cut off the view. Soon, on the left, in the edge of a wood, horsemen were seen. Lee's staff turned their glasses on them to ascertain whether they were friends or foes. There was a moment's scrutiny, and then the breeze rippled the blue cross against the red field of the flag the troops were carrying. The cavalry at the same moment decided that the marching column was Longstreet's and they started for it. As their leader galloped ahead, his flowing beard and familiar garb identified him as Stuart. Well, General, Lee inquired, the instant Stuart had ridden up and had exchanged greetings, what of Jackson? He has fallen back from Manassas, Stuart answered, and is holding the enemy at bay at Sudley's Ford. We must hurry on and help him, said Lee. Is there no path by which we may move our tired men and get them out of the heat and dust? There was no other road. Stuart had to advise that the infantry keep to the main highway till Gainesville was reached and then turn to the left into the Warrenton Gainesville Centerville Turnpike. This would bring Longstreet to Jackson's right flank. The arrival of the cavalry was most reassuring because it could guard the exposed right of Longstreet's column from sudden attack based on Warrenton. The infantry were halted in the road so that the cavalry might cross to the south for this purpose. Refreshed by the rest this pause afforded them, the regiments took up the march and soon were close to Gainesville. The sound of desultory artillery fire had beaten an uncertain accompaniment to the ramp of the troops for several miles, and now it swelled in faster time. The pace grew swifter, the banter died away. Lee's mind was busy. How strong was the enemy, and how disposed? Was Jackson's line secure? Could contact be established easily? Had the Army of Northern Virginia won the race to Pope? If not, how much of McClellan's army was with the general whose headquarters were in the saddle? Lee had not intended to bring his campaign of maneuver to an issue, but there, ahead of him, Jackson was waging a defensive battle. Or was there a prospect of victory, beyond the ridge, where the smoke was rising? As Lee pondered, the head of the column reached Gainesville. The Manassas Gap Railway and the road followed by the army continued to the southeast, the Warrenton-Gainesville-Centerville Turnpike ran to the northeast, like the course of an arrow in still air. The leading regiment of Hood's division turned to the left into the turnpike, and Jackson, who had been watching the advance, rode out for a moment and spoke to Hood. The time, which was subsequently disputed in the trial of Fitz John Porter, was around 10.30, perhaps a little earlier. Lee came up shortly thereafter and established his headquarters on a little hill about 400 yards south of the turnpike in rear of the ground where Hood's men were quietly forming their line of battle. 
He sat down on a stump to await reconnaissance. Presently there galloped up from the left a solitary courier sent by General William E. Stark to ascertain whether the troops who were taking position with so much composure were Federals or the long-awaited divisions of Longstreet. The courier paused only long enough to make sure and then he returned as fast as Spurs could force his jaded horse toward the waiting and weary captors of Manassas. It's Longstreet, he cried joyously so that every listening ear caught the words. A mighty cheer went up, and Jackson's men knew for the first time that the worst danger was past, that Army of Northern Virginia was united again. Jackson's foot cavalry had reason both to rejoice and to be proud, for their performance from the time Lee had heard of their arrival at Bristow Station and at Manassas had been almost as splendid as their march to Pope's rear. On the morning of the 27th, after Trimble and Stewart had seized the base at Manassas Junction, Hills and Jackson's divisions had marched to that point, leaving Ewell at Bristow, to dispute the federal pursuit and, ere retiring, to burn the railroad bridge over Broad Run. Taylor's federal brigade had come up from Alexandria and had attacked near Manassas Junction in the belief that it was encountering only a raiding party. Jackson had tried to save the New Jersey troops from slaughter by demanding their surrender, but they had rushed on and had been wrecked. Unhindered thereafter, Jackson's men had sacked the immense stores. Many had found clothing and shoes, others, feasting freely, had thought only to supply the inner man. All had been allowed to help themselves, because as Jackson had only his ambulances with him, there had been no hope of removing much of the plunder. While the men of Hill and of Talia Pharaoh had been thus pleasantly engaged, Ewell had been holding off a threatening attack at Bristow Station. During the night of August 2728, Talia Pharaoh had marched to a new position, northwest of Manassas, the rear guard had destroyed the base and two miles of loaded freight cars, and then, after Ewell had broken off the fight at Bristow, first Hill and then he had moved to join Talia Pharaoh. Jackson had most admirably chosen his new position. Moving to the northwest, he had occupied a long ridge at Groveton, where he would be able to withdraw to Thoroughfare Gap, or north of Bull Run Mountains if hard-pressed, yet where he commanded a long sweep of the Gainesville-Centerville Turnpike, in case an unwary foe should move across his front. In seeking to locate Jackson, Pope had lost much time in mistaken maneuvers. Jackson, waiting quietly, had let Pope wear out his men at hide and seek until the late afternoon of the 28th when he had hurled his right wing, 8,000 men, against King's division, which he had assumed to be the flank guard of a passing army corps. The enemy had resisted with great stubbornness and had not been driven off the field until 9 o'clock on the evening of August 28. Jackson's loss had been heavy and had included two of his three division commanders, Ewell and Talia Farrow. Ewell had lost a leg and would be absent for months. Talia Farrow's wounds were not serious, though they temporarily incapacitated him. The vigil of the night had been relieved, despite these losses, by the knowledge that the rest of the army was near at hand. The cannonading at Thoroughfare Gap had been heard on Jackson's lines. On the morning of the 29th, Jackson had found the Federals farther to his left, interposed between him and Washington. He had slightly changed position to conform and had drawn his line along and close to the cut of the so-called unfinished railroad, which was an excavated grade intended to give the Manassas Gap Railroad direct connection with Alexandria, instead of by way of Manassas Junction. Jackson's division, now under Brigadier General Stark, had been placed on the right, where Longstreet was expected to join him. Ewell's division, commanded by Brigadier General A. R. Lawton, had been put in the center, and Hill had been given the left, the post of greatest danger. These dispositions had been made and two vigorous artillery exchanges had occurred when word had been passed down the line that Longstreet had come up. The whole operation, from the start at Warrenton Springs Ford to the moment of Lee's arrival on the scene, had been conducted on Jackson's part without a serious mistake of any sort. His troops were weary and were sadly deficient in senior officers, but their spirit was high, and when they saw their old comrades of the seven days file into position, they turned again defiantly to the enemy, who was massing on the front as Longstreet came up. Longstreet's line was formed promptly. Hood's division was placed perpendicular to the turnpike, with its left close to the right of Jackson's line. Evans was in immediate support. Three brigades under Wilcox were put in rear of Hood's left, and three others under Kemper were behind Hood's right. D. R. Jones's division was sent to the right of Hood, where his flank rested on the Manassas Gap Railroad. 
It was an admirable position in which to meet an attack, though not quite so good for hurling quickly the full weight of the army in assault. Communication from one flank to the other was open. With Jackson extending to the northeast along the unfinished railroad, Longstreet's line was shaping itself southward. The whole front formed an angle of approximately 160 degrees, strongest at the apex, which was near the Gainesville-Centerville Road, looking east. Hood's batteries, which had taken position immediately upon arrival, were now strengthened by some of Longstreet's already famous companies of the Washington Artillery. Their brisk and well-directed fire quickly caused the enemy to shift his line opposite Jackson's right. As Anderson's division, which had followed Longstreet from Warrenton Springs Ford, was known to be close enough to share in any general engagement, Lee had at hand all the troops he could hope to put into action, whereas troops arriving from McClellan might so strengthen Pope that he could seize the initiative. Lee's martial instinct and his military judgment alike told him that the thing to do was to attack at once. He so informed Longstreet. But old Pete was not satisfied. He believed, as Maurice has aptly said, that the recipe for victory was to maneuver the army into a position where the enemy would have to attack disadvantageously, and he asked for time in which to examine the ground more fully and to ascertain what force was gathering on his right. Reluctantly Lee consented. Longstreet rode off to the southeast, near the flank of Jones's division, and climbed an eminence there. Lee waited. The artillery duel continued. The Federals seemed to be moving away to concentrate against Jackson's left. After a while, Longstreet returned. He was full of misgiving. The Federals extended far to the south of the turnpike, he said. The terrain was not inviting. Besides, there was no telling what force the enemy might be bringing up from the direction of Manassas Junction. An attack might send the Confederate right flank squarely into a strong Federal column. Lee was disappointed. It would be possible, he said, to send troops beyond the Federal left and to seize the strong ground of which Longstreet spoke. As the two debated, a message arrived from General Stewart, who was on reconnaissance down the road leading from Gainesville to Manassas. Stewart said that a column was approaching from that direction. Another force, reckoned as a full army corps, was advancing on the road from Bristow to Sudley Springs, and if not halted would strike Longstreet's flank. He had an excellent artillery position, Stewart stated, and was having men drive the road from Gainesville toward the Federals, to raise a dust and create an impression that troops were moving out to meet the Federals, but if the ground was to be held, reinforcements had to be dispatched to that quarter immediately. Wilcox's three brigades were at once ordered to move from the center, in rear of Hood's left, around to the right of Jones. Longstreet hurried off to see the situation for himself and to dispose Wilcox's men as they came up on the right. Again, Lee had to wait. As he studied the woods and ridges in front of him, while the artillery still thundered on the center and the dust clouds rose from the direction of Bristow and Manassas to the southeast, Jackson rode up, weary and disheveled. It was the first time Lee had seen him since they had ended their memorable council at Jeffersonton on the afternoon of the 25th, and their brief conversation must have been of Jackson's march, of his battle with King on the 28th, and of the ominous movement of the Federals to his left flank. As they talked, Longstreet returned. This time he was somewhat reassured. The force opposite his right was hardly left enough as yet to threaten his flank, he said, but there was more dust down the road toward Manassas. Further troops might be moving in that direction. Hadn't we better move our line forward? Lee asked, with the deference it had become his habit to show his division commanders, especially Longstreet, in all matters of tactics on the field of battle. I think not, Longstreet answered cautiously, we had better wait until we hear more from Stuart about the force he has reported moving against us from Manassas. Jackson said nothing. Lee hesitated to order an attack where the man who was to deliver it was opposed to it, so he unwillingly consented to await developments a while longer. Jackson rode off, for the fire from the left of his line was growing in volume. Soon Stewart arrived to confirm what Longstreet had said of a movement up the road from Manassas. The troops that were coming up were almost certainly Porter's Corps. Pope's command was being reinforced still further by the Army of the Potomac, Dark News. The last lap of the race to Pope was being run on the field of battle. Lee determined now to ascertain the facts for himself. 
Leaving Stewart at headquarters, he made a personal reconnaissance. This satisfied him that the Confederate line outflanked the Federals, whose numbers did not seem to exceed 10,000. After an hour, he rode back to the hill. His first inquiry was for Stuart. Here I am, General, Stuart answered instantly, rising from the ground where he had been sleeping calmly throughout the whole of his chief's absence. I want you to send a message to your troops over on the left, to send a few more cavalry over to the right. I would better go myself, said Stuart, and he rode off singing loudly his favorite giant the cavalry. For the third time, Lee declared himself for an attack. He believed that a drive along the Gainesville-Centerville turnpike would certainly dislodge the force on the right at the same time that it would relieve Jackson, whose troops were now furiously engaged on the extreme left. Longstreet was obdurate. The day was nearly done, old Pete argued. An advance would get nowhere and might have disastrous. It would be far better to make a reconnaissance later in the evening. Then, if an opening were found, the whole army could be thrown against the enemy. Lee hesitated. Judgment and consideration for the opinion of his subordinate were at odds. At length, though unconvinced, he assented. His decision was reached after far too little deliberation and probably was expressed in a very few words, but the moment was an important one in the military career of Lee, important less in its effect on the outcome of the battle than in its bearing on Lee's future relations with Longstreet. In all the operations since Lee had taken command of the Army of Northern Virginia he had not shown any of the excessive consideration for the feelings of others that he had exhibited in West Virginia in his dealings with General Loring, now it appeared again. The seeds of much of the disaster at Gettysburg were sown in that instant, when Lee yielded to Longstreet and Longstreet discovered that he would. Longstreet, satisfied, set about preparing Hood's division for a reconnaissance in force. Wilcox was ordered back from the right to be ready to support Hood, with whom Evans was to move. The roar from the left now told of such a battle as even the Army of Northern Virginia had seldom fought. Hill, on Jackson's left flank, had his six brigades in a double line from right to left as follows, Field, Thomas, and Gregg in front, with Branch, Pender, and Archer in support. They were along or close to the cut of the unfinished railroad, on ground where the artillery could do little to protect the infantry or to drive back the enemy. Gregg's South Carolinians, on the extreme left, occupied a small, rocky, wooded knoll, with the railroad cut on the east and north fronts, and a cleared field to the northwest. Against this line, now swinging to the right and now to the left, Pope threw his troops in successive charges from three o'clock until six. On some parts of the front the ammunition was exhausted after the second federal assault and the men had to meet the enemy with the bayonet. On Thomas's front the enemy gained the cut and was driven back from it. Gregg, with the cartridge boxes of his men empty, sent word to his division commander, tell General Hill that my ammunition is exhausted, but that I will hold my position with the bayonet. And when the federal general, Cuvier Grover, threw his men into the gap in the line between Thomas and Gregg, in what a philosophical colonel styled the consummation of the grand debate between Massachusetts and South Carolina, Gregg rallied them for a last stand weary and deaf, he walked up and down his thin line with an old revolutionary scimitar in his hand. Let us die here, my men, he said, let us die here. The enemy was across the railroad cut, and the survivors of the regiments that had fought in the swamp at Gaines's mill were preparing to meet them with steel when there was a shout behind them. Thinking that they were surrounded, they turned in dread and saw the familiar gray of Early's brigades and a part of Lawton's, comparatively fresh. There was a brief, wild encounter, then the Federals were repulsed once more and were forced to retreat beyond the line of the unfinished railroad. Of all this, Lee could see nothing, but as he received no call for assistance from Jackson, he knew that all was well. About sunset, Hood was sent forward along the turnpike to make the reconnaissance that Longstreet had favored. He had not gone far before he encountered a federal force advancing to attack him. A quick, fierce clash occurred in gathering darkness. Wilcox was hurried to support Hood's left, and Hunton, with a brigade of Kempers, formed on the right of Hood. Together, they swept on into the federal positions and were engulfed by twilight. It was late when it came back to Lee and Longstreet and reported that he had advanced so far that he could not distinguish Bluecoat from Gray. He advocated a withdrawal to his original line. 
More than that, he had made, at Longstreet's instance, as careful a study as possible of the enemy's position. His conclusion was disconcerting, almost disheartening. The ground held by the enemy was very strong, he said. An attack the next morning would be dangerous. General Wilcox, who made a separate report, was of the same opinion. By Lee's order, Hood immediately began to withdraw. On the way out he met R. H. Anderson's division, which had completed the long march as rearguard from Warrenton Springs Ford, and, undirected, had pushed forward almost into the enemy's lines. The information supplied by Hood and Wilcox threw Lee back on his original plan to avoid a general engagement and to rely on maneuver in forcing Pope from Northern Virginia. He sent off a dispatch to the president, recounting what had happened, and then he retired to a little cabin some 400 yards to the left of the turnpike, about three-quarters of a mile behind Hood's lines, there to await the returning sun. Day broke clear and bright on the morning of the fateful 30th of August, and in a stillness that did not suggest a renewal of the enemy's attacks. On some parts of the line scarcely a gun was fired as the sun began to climb upward, while the hungry men stirred in the nearby cornfields to find for themselves the rations the commissary could not supply. Lee was satisfied that if the enemy dared to attack, he would be repulsed in two hours, but such slight movements as could be observed from headquarters, which were re-established on the ridge where they had been located on the previous evening, suggested a withdrawal rather than an assault. The feeling spread that the enemy might escape. When Lee sat down to write an early morning dispatch to the president, his mind was not on an offensive battle but on the possibility of further maneuvers to clear the enemy from fruitful northern Virginia. My dispatches, he said, will have informed you of the march of this portion of the army. Its progress has been necessarily slow, having a large and superior force on its flank, narrow and rough roads to travel, and the difficulties of obtaining forage and provisions to contend with. It has so far advanced in safety and has succeeded in deceiving the enemy as to its object. The movement has, as far as I am able to judge, drawn the enemy from the Rappahannock frontier and caused him to concentrate his troops between Manassas and Centerville. My desire has been to avoid a general engagement, being the weaker force, and by maneuvering to relieve the portion of the country referred to. I think if not overpowered we shall be able to relieve other portions of the country, as it seems to be the purpose of the enemy to collect his strength here. By the oddest chance, and in the most ironical contrast, General Pope a few minutes before had telegraphed to General Halleck his appraisal of the situation. We fought a terrific battle here yesterday, he reported. We have lost not less than 8,000 men killed and wounded, but from the appearance of the land the enemy lost at least two to one. The news just reaches me from the front that the enemy is retreating towards the mountains. About eight o'clock the enemy's batteries opened a slow fire, but this caused no apprehension. For at dawn, Stephen D., Lee's battalion of reserve artillery, 18 guns, had come up and had taken the position occupied by the Washington artillery on the 29th, a ridge near the center and somewhat in advance of the infantry, a quarter of a mile in length and facing open ground in front for a distance of about 2,000 yards. You are just where I wanted you, General Lee said to the alert young colonel, stay there. With these guns so advantageously placed to support the batteries attached to the infantry commands, Lee felt that he had little to fear in an artillery engagement, even from the superior ordnance of the Federals, though his ammunition was so low that he had to urge economy in its expenditure. The fire kept up for about an hour, then it died away in a silence more profound than before. Lee began to formulate the details of the next move in his campaign of maneuver. Studying the map, he decided that if the Federals made no assault during the day he would demonstrate along the line in the afternoon, then slip across Bull Run in the vicinity of Sudley Springs after nightfall and endeavor once again to get in Pope's rear. Straining ears heard the distant rumbling of artillery wheels about noon, and anxious eyes ere long saw rising clouds of dust on the left. General Stewart reported that from a perch in a great walnut tree, one of his men could see the Federals gradually massing in three heavy lines opposite Jackson. Perhaps Pope intended to attack, after all. Couriers were dispatched to put the troops on the alert. Jackson joined Lee and Longstreet at headquarters. Stewart was summoned and came up quickly. Over the field there passed the expectancy that always lights the eyes of the brave and makes them look to their arms ere the long roll is sounded and the grim fallen is shouted. Preparations were complete, the generals reported. 
D, our Jones had been advanced slightly on the right and Jackson had sheltered his men in the woods northwest of the railroad cut, both to rest them and to mystify the Federals. Unless still more of McClellan's troops had come up during the night to swell Pope's numbers to invincible odds, Lee had only to fear that the army would run out of ammunition or that Jackson's thinned regiments would be overborne. Jackson returned to his command. Longstreet still had some doubt whether the Federal Army really would take the offensive, so he went off toward Hood's position to prepare for the demonstration intended to precede the movement that was to be made to Sudley Springs that night, in case the Federals did not attack. Stuart galloped away to make his dispositions. As Lee, at headquarters, waited and watched, there arrived an unexpected visitor in the person of General Pendleton. He was sick and travel-worn, but along with dispatches from President Davis he brought the good news that the rest of the reserve artillery was on the march to Lee and that D. H. Hill's division was at Rapidan Station. On the next move, whatever it might be, Lee would have reinforcements. That meant much. He sent General Pendleton off to rest and turned to ascertain the meaning of the fire that was now rolling heavily from Jackson's front. The Federals had begun a new attack. At first, it was heaviest on Jackson's right. Opposite the 2nd Brigade of Jackson's old division, the enemy got so close to the cut that opposing flags were only ten yards apart. When the ammunition of the Confederates was exhausted, they took up rocks from the embankment and beat back the enemy with these. One officer, having no arms with him, fought throughout with stones. For half an hour the battle raged here, then it appeared to be directed chiefly against the left flank, as on the previous afternoon. Lee turned to his signal officer, Captain J. L. Bartlett, who had established his station near headquarters, and had him flagged to Jackson, two miles off, what is the result of the movements on your left? Presently the answer came back, so far, the enemy appeared to be trying to get possession of a piece of woods to withdraw out of our sight. But old Jack was wrong. Quickly the Federals returned in force that made their first assault seem as nothing more than a skirmish. Hill's men, fighting hard, began to waver at one point in the line, and Jackson quickly sent word to Longstreet and Lee, asking for reinforcements. Lee immediately forwarded an order to Longstreet to hurry a division to Jackson. Longstreet received this message while standing on high ground near the center, whence he could see the left flank of the Federals who were then renewing their assault on Jackson's right at the same time they were pounding his left. As the Federal left was within easy artillery range of his guns, Longstreet reasoned that a well-directed fire would break up the attack before he could possibly march a division to Jackson's relief. He had noticed, as he had ridden up, that the battery commanders, with instincts surer in this case than his own, had been anticipating an order to advance and had their horses harnessed and the men standing to the guns. It now took him only a minute to send an aide dashing back to bring up these batteries. Samuel Chapman's company, the first to arrive, went quickly into action, Captain Robert Boyce followed, Captain James Riley's six-gun battery swept up with foam-covered horses. Stephen D. Lee's 18 guns were ready. Across the road, at his field headquarters, Lee was waiting. All around him officers were a quiver, but the general did not move a muscle. As some wagons passed to the front, he turned to a subordinate and said, calmly, I observe that some of those mules are without shoes. I wish you would see to it that all of the animals are shot at once. A moment later he heard the loud crash of Longstreet's guns. The expression of his face did not change in the slightest. Taking the fire to mean that Longstreet had probably decided on some other measure of relief than the dispatch of reinforcements, Lee sent Longstreet word that if he saw anything better to do than to reinforce Jackson, he should do it. Perceiving soon the effect of Longstreet's fire, Lee signaled Jackson, do you still want reinforcements? And, as the federal flank began to melt away, he saw that a great opportunity had come. Instantly he seized it, let our H. Anderson move from reserve to support Longstreet, order Longstreet to attack at once with his full force, pass the word to right and to left for a general assault, throw every man in his army against Pope. Quick action would engulf the whole of the federal left and left center. As the lines prepared to move forward, the answer to Lee's signal came back from Jackson half an hour after it had been sent. No, Jackson said, he did not need reinforcements, the enemy are giving way. Hill's men had rallied, Pender and Brockenbro had been advanced, the Federals had been repulsed in their front. 
Longstreet had anticipated the order to attack, his lines were about to move forward when Lee's messenger reached him. The battle smoke drifted back to headquarters, the roar of the guns shook the hills. There was victory in the air. General Longstreet is advancing, Lee signaled Jackson, look out for and protect his left flank, for Longstreet's left would have to advance almost across the front of Jackson's right, unless Jackson could advance simultaneously. Were the troops all round, a P hill there on Jackson's left, early in the center, and then Jackson's division? On Longstreet's line, did Wilcox, next Jackson's right, understand what was expected of him? Was Hood on the right of Wilcox, with Evans and R. H. Anderson in support? Was Kemper, with three brigades, flanking Hood and D. R. Jones, properly disposed on the extreme right? Northeast for Longstreet's right, east for the troops on his left, Jackson's direction would be east and southeast. What if there was a measure of convergence between left and right, apt to cause piling up of the troops nearest the center along the Gainesville-Centerville turnpike? It was a small matter compared with the possibilities that the break on Pope's right center presented. A general advance on the ridges occupied by the Federals might hurl the foe back to the famous old stone bridge across Bull Run, with the prospect of a confused slaughter there. Forward, then. The assault began with far greater precision than at Gaines's Mill or at Malvern Hill. Instead of the wasteful attacks in detail, nearly the whole of the right went forward simultaneously. The spearhead, as on June 27, was the Texas Brigade, vigorously supported by Law, then by Evans and later by R. H. Anderson, who'd met the Federals within 150 yards of his position. Very soon the resistance was stiff and the field confused. Jackson's division did not come up promptly. The advance of Longstreet's left was exposed to an enfilading fire from batteries that had been placed in front of Jackson's right. Time was lost in silencing these guns, though Lee hurried orders to Jackson to hasten this advance. In the face of this opposition, Wilcox was directed to move his brigade to the right to support Hood. On Wilcox's departure, Featherston, who was slow in starting, and Pryor, who commanded the third of Wilcox's brigades, became bewildered and ere long drifted to the left, where they fought under Jackson. Off on the right of Longstreet, G. T. Anderson faced a very heavy fire and lacked the support of Drayton's brigade, which was held up, without authority, on a false report from the cavalry that the enemy were moving to turn the extreme Confederate right flank. Despite these checks and complications, the line swept one. The easy rounded ridges, General Sorrell later wrote, ran at right angles to the turnpike, and over these infantry and artillery poured in pursuit. The artillery would gallop furiously to the nearest ridge, limber to the front, deliver a few rounds until the enemy was out of range, and then gallop again to the next ridge. Far in front, the 5th Texas saw nothing of Kemper's supporting column on its right, but it did not relax its pace. The color bearer, Private Jimmy Harris, insisted on rushing ahead, waving the flag, until he was 60 or 70 yards in front of the line, then he would halt, turn toward his comrades and shout, come on. When he was shot down, another man seized the colors, only to fall within 200 paces. Then a captain took the standard and bore it onward, to pass it at length into the hands of a private who seemed to have a charmed life. Hood's men were well blown when they halted at the Chin House, near which Tombs, on the right, was troubled by a persistent enfilading battery. But Dick Anderson was up now and mingled his men with Hood's in a continued pursuit. Jackson's thin line was moving, also, the enemy was in general retreat except were stubbornly resisting at strong points opposite the Confederate right. But the end of the pursuit had to come before the objective was reached. Scattered by their advance of more than a mile and a half, weakened by losses and confused by strange ground, Longstreet's men were overtaken by darkness as they approached the ridge of the Henry House. The sky had become overcast. Visibility was low. A storm was threatened. There was danger that a farther advance would throw Federal and Confederates so close together that the Southerners would fire into their own ranks. The 5th Texas slipped the bridle, as had put it, and made a last wild attack, but gradually the infantry became disengaged or were halted, and only the artillery, firing blindly, kept up the sound of battle. Through a rain that soon began to fall, the Federals surged back across Yim's branch and the stone bridge at Bull Run, protected in their flight by a few regiments that held the hill of the Henry House with magnificent resolution. 
Li had not been able to remain at headquarters in the unparticipating rear while his troops were making the most triumphant advance their banners had ever shown upon. When the infantry had started, he had followed fast with his officers, and during the time when Longstreet's left had been exposed to an enfilade, he would have ridden straight into the fire had not old Pete, after pleading in vain for Lee to turn back, guided him under cover of a cross ravine. Freed after a short time from the protesting voice of Longstreet, Lee had ridden forward over the dead-strewn field before the merciful darkness had hidden any of its horrors. He had reached the most advanced artillery position just after the order to cease firing had been given, and from the crest of the ridge, astride traveler, he studied the ground in front with his binoculars. Not fifteen feet from him was a silent gun. General, said Captain Mason of the staff, when Lee at last dropped his glasses, here is someone who wants to speak to you. Lee looked and saw a powder-blackened gunner, his sponge staff in his hand. Ever since he had been asked for a chew of tobacco by the raw private in Western Virginia, he had been accustomed to receive all manner of complaints and requests at unexpected places from unknown members of the voluntary association known as the Army of Northern Virginia, so there was no surprise in his voice when he said, Well, my man, what can I do for you? Why, General, said the cannoneer in aggrieved and familiar tones, don't you know me? It was Robert. Headquarters for the night were established in an open field, and a fire of boards was lighted for the reading of dispatches. These were unanimous in asserting a victory on every part of the field. Lee's spirits rose and his gratitude to God increased as the good news continued to come in, especially when the commanders were able to report that though many a good man had fallen, the losses of the day had not been excessive. Presently had rode up, weary and proud. Lee greeted him cordially. What, he asked, had become of the enemy? Hood answered enthusiastically that Pope's army had been driven across Bull Run almost at the double quick. It had been a beautiful sight, he said, to see the Confederate battle flags dancing after the retreating Federals. God forbid, said Lee, I should ever live to see our colors moving in the opposite direction. Colonel Long came after a full reconnaissance and told how the Federals had vanished. Stuart wrote that Robertson's cavalry had pursued the foe across Bull Run, while Fitz Lee had been scouting as far in the enemy's rear as Fairfax Courthouse. Stuart was anxious to get permission to organize a night attack with the help of Armistead's brigade of infantry, which had been acting with him, but Lee would not approve. In this atmosphere, Lee sat down to compose his victory dispatch that would have to be carried all the way back to Rapidan before it could be telegraphed to Richmond and announced to the anxious southern people. Here is what he wrote. Groveton, August 30th, 10 o'clock p.m. Press Davis, this army today achieved on the plains of Manassas a signal victory over combined forces of generals. McClellan and Pope. On the 28th and 29th each wing under generals. Longstreet and Jackson repulsed with valor attacks made on them separately. We mourn the loss of our gallant dead in every conflict yet our gratitude to Almighty God for His mercies rises higher and higher each day, to Him and to the valor of our troops a nation's gratitude is due. R. E. Lee When a short night's rest ended with daylight on August 31st, the rain was still falling, a sharp wind was blowing, all the roads except the turnpike were heavy with mud, and Bull Run, rising fast, was in danger of becoming impassable. Although Lee was satisfied with the results of the previous day's fighting, he said little and he did not minimize the difficulties that still confronted him. The stone bridge was down. Pursuit would be slow, if possible at all. Reports indicated that the enemy was at Centerville, doubtless in the works the Confederates had labored the previous winter to render impregnable. Worse still, Fitz Lee wrote that Franklin's and Sumner's corps, from McClellan's army, together with Sturgis's and Cox's divisions, had arrived at Centerville. Pope had not been defeated a day too soon. Even now, heavy odds had to be faced by an army that was at this time almost without provisions and incapable of sustained action until the commissary could find food. This paralyzing shortage of food was, perhaps, the most serious condition of all, for even the Army of Northern Virginia traveled on its belly. The caissons and ordnance train, moreover, were almost empty. Clad in rubber overalls and with a rubber poncho over his shoulders, Lee rode out early on a short reconnaissance across Bull Run accompanied by Jackson to see the situation at first hand. Soon he came under fire of the enemy's pickets. 
Pope evidently was still close at hand. Returning, Lee was satisfied that his only possible course was to continue to maneuver and, if possible, once more to interpose his army between Pope and Washington or so to threaten Pope's flank as to force him into a further retreat. Lee explained this to Longstreet and to Jackson and gave his orders for the day, Jackson, being nearest the exposed flank of the enemy, was to take his entire command and cross Bull Run at Sudley Springs. He was to move north until he struck the Little River Turnpike. Then he was to turn southeast again. If all went well, this would put Jackson on the enemy's line of retreat and would force the evacuation of Centerville. To aid Jackson, Stuart and his cavalry, supported by a brigade of infantry, were to pass over Bull Run and create a diversion. Longstreet was to remain on the battlefield, looking after the wounded and burying the dead, until Jackson had a good start. Then Longstreet was to follow, and D.H. Hill, when he arrived from the south, was to complete the gruesome work Longstreet left unfinished. The plan was as simple as it was bold, and it appealed to Jackson. Good, said he, when Lee had finished, and without another word, he set out to put his part in execution. Later in the day, after Jackson left, and while Longstreet was preparing to place some of his units in line of march, Lee again rode over a section of the field. He was with his staff when he came upon a sergeant of the 16th Mississippi, who had been into the woods to relieve a dead Federal of a pair of northern shoes, wherewith to cover his bare feet. Lee hailed him, What are you doing here, sir, he said, away from your command. The sergeant, who had no idea of the identity of his inquisitor, answered gamely, That's none of your business, by God. You are a straggler, sir, and deserve the severest punishment. It's a damned lie, sir, the sergeant returned hotly. I only left my regiment a few minutes ago to hunt me a pair of shoes. I went through all the fight yesterday, and that's more than you can say, for where were you yesterday when General Stewart wanted your damned cavalry to charge the Yankees after we put em to running? You were lying back in the pine thickets and couldn't be found, but today, when there's no danger, you come out and charge other men with straggling, damn you. Lee had to laugh, and, finding no ready answer, rode subdued on his way. He probably did not hear one of his officers ask the sergeant if he knew to whom he was talking. To a cowardly Virginia cavalryman, the offended N.C.O. stoutly answered. No, sir, that was General Lee. Ho, oh, what? General Lee, did you say? Yes. And his staff? Yes. Scissors to grind, I'm a goner, and with no more ado, he started running down the road as fast as he could. The cowardly Virginia cavalryman rode on, ere long, to Stuart's farm and dismounted in a thick wood to make some dispositions. He was standing by Traveller, with the reins on the animal's neck. Suddenly a cry was raised, Yankee cavalry. Traveller started at the sudden commotion, and Lee stepped forward to catch the bridle. As he did so he tripped in his long overalls and fell forward. He caught himself on both hands and was up in an instant, but it was soon apparent that he was hurt. The scare of Union cavalry proving unfounded, the nearest surgeon was sent for. He found a small bone broken in one hand and the other hand badly sprained. Both had to be put in splints and treated with a liniment. As this of course kept Lee from riding, he had, much against his will, to enter an ambulance. Reports that Lee had been wounded in battle spread quickly and, in the north, were coupled with fictitious accounts of how it had happened. To the injured general, as he waited for Jackson's rear to clear the muddy road for Longstreet's advance, General Pope sent a message asking for a truce. Lee consented that the federal ambulances should enter the lines to remove the wounded but he would not agree to a suspension of hostilities. At 2 p.m., he set Longstreet in motion and left his old headquarters. A band cheerfully saluted him with the strains of Dixie. The road the army had to follow to Sudley Springs on Bull Run was narrow and muddy. Progress was almost as slow as on that wet 2D of July when the same troops had fought through equally tenacious mud in their effort to overtake McClellan's retreat from Malvern Hill. Night found Longstreet not yet across Bull Run. Jackson was on the Little River Turnpike with his front toward Fairfax Courthouse, but his weary men had not been able to move fast enough to get in rear of Pope. 
Stuart had been hovering on the enemy's flank and had employed his horse artillery against a wagon train that crowded the road of the enemy's retreat, but he had accomplished no substantial result. In a word, the exhaustion of the hungry men and the condition of the roads cost Lee virtually the whole advantage he had hoped to gain on the critical first day after the victory. The rain had ceased falling on the morning of September 1, but the army was still hungry. Jackson's column, though covered by Stuart's cavalry, moved very slowly. Not until the late afternoon did it reach the vicinity of the friendly mansions of Chantilly, which Lee remembered with the affection of his boyhood days. It was then apparent that the enemy was fully aware of the threat to his flank and was prepared. At Jackson's order, Hill sent forward branches and Brockenbrough's brigades to feel out the enemy. The rest of Hill's division was placed on the right of the line, with Ewell's troops in the center and Jackson's own division on the left. All these troops were on the right of the road, with the artillery massed on an eminence to the left. A heavy thunderstorm had set in as the troops had approached Chantilly, and as the two brigades went forward the rain beat in the men's faces, almost blinding them. The Federals met the attack with vigor. Massing on the flank in front of Branch, they drove him back on his supports, along with Brockenbrough, and when three more brigades of Hill's division were thrown into the battle, they, too, were roughly handled. The battle soon engulfed a part of Ewell's division in the midst of almost continuous thunder that drowned the roar of the guns. Night was falling before there was any wavering in the Federal line and even then it was darkness rather than defeat that led the enemy to withdraw slightly. Longstreet by this time had come up in support of Jackson, but as the battle had died away there was nothing for him to do. The rain, in fact, was so heavy that the whole field was in confusion and the final withdrawal of the enemy was unobserved. A little later, scouting parties reported that the Federals were still in great strength a short distance down the road. Lee himself had no part in this action, which sometimes is styled Chantilly and sometimes Ox Hill. He had established his headquarters in a left farmhouse where he had no more exciting experience than to be challenged by his own sentinel when he returned from a brief walk with Colonel Marshall. He had one somber report, however, in the closing minutes of the fight, a Federal officer had unwittingly ridden into the Confederate lines and, when observed, had quickly turned his horse and had attempted to gallop off. He had fallen before the fire of some Confederates who later picked up his dead body and brought it into the lines. With the regret that soldiers always feel at the death of a brilliant and gallant foe, he was identified as Brigadier General Phil Kearney, commander of the 1st Division of Heinzelman's Corps. When they told Lee of the incident, he must have had a sudden picture of the old days in Mexico, especially of the Battle of Churubusco, when Yen Kearney had led his pursuing troopers under the very walls of Santa Ana's capital. Lee had the corpse prepared for burial, and the next day sent it into the lines with a brief note to General Pope, the body of General Philip Kearney, he wrote, was brought from the field last night, and he was reported dead. I send it forward under a flag of truce, thinking that possession of his remains may be a consolation to his family. When the skirmish line went forward later in the morning over the same road that the bearers of the flag followed, it was found that the enemy had evacuated his position both at Centerville and in front of Jackson. Stuart's cavalry went in pursuit, only to discover that the long federal columns were moving steadily toward the Washington entrenchments, whither it would be futile to pursue them. About the hour Lee realized from these reports that this phase of his campaign of maneuver was at an end, President Davis was sending to the Confederate Congress the recent dispatches from Lee, including the message written on the field of 2nd Manassas after the Battle of the 30th. It had been received in Richmond on September 1st, and its content was of course known ere this to the Congress, but there was pride and jubilation in Davis's closing sentence. Too much praise, said he, cannot be bestowed upon the skill and daring of the commanding general who conceived, or the valor and hardihood of the troops who executed, the brilliant movement whose result is now communicated. The words did not exaggerate the fact, nor did they even touch upon the contrast between the situation Mr. Davis described and that which had existed three months previous to the very day. On June 2, Lee's first full day in command of the Army of Northern Virginia, McClellan had been in front of Richmond, Jackson was being pursued up the Shenandoah Valley by three strong forces, Western Virginia was completely in the hands of the Federals, and the North Carolina coast was overrun. 
Now, Western Virginia was almost evacuated, Confederate cavalry were soon to cross into Ohio at Ravenswood, Winchester was about to be abandoned, the North Carolina coast was safe, and the wrecked Army of Virginia, together with most of the Army of the Potomac, was in full retreat on Washington. Despairing officials in the federal capital had given orders to ship all movable government property to New York. The government clerks were called out to share in the anticipated defense of the city. Except for the troops at Norfolk and at Fort Monroe, the only Federals closer than 100 miles to Richmond were prisoners of war and men who were busily preparing to retreat from the base at Aquia Creek. This amazing transformation had been wrought at a time when the Confederates on other fronts had been able to do nothing to relieve the pressure on Virginia. It had been the work, and exclusively the work, of the Army of Northern Virginia with the assistance of such units as had been brought from the Carolinas and Georgia. And what the Army of Northern Virginia had executed, with numbers pitifully inferior to the combined strength of the forces it had confronted, General Lee had planned. His operations had improved in excellence as they had developed. By every standard, 2nd Manassas was better than the Seven Days. Staff work was incomparably superior. The artillery had been more effectively employed. So had the cavalry. The intelligence service was much improved. The superiority of the tactics was attested by the relative losses. From the crossing of the Rapidan to the final pursuit of the Federals into the Washington defenses, Confederate casualties had been 91-12, and an exceptionally large percentage of these were men but slightly wounded. Pope's casualties August 16 to September 2 were 14,462, including 4,163 prisoners. The losses in the campaign thus were, roughly, four and a half Confederates to seven Federals. During the seven days they had been five Confederates to four Federals. Like his tactics, Lee's strategy was better at 2nd Manassas than around Richmond. It was better because it was somewhat simpler, and, still more, because it placed responsibility in the hands of fewer men. There were no more attempts to bring six commands, under six semi-independent generals, together on the field of battle, as at Fraser's farm. Divisions remained, as did divisional commanders, but the responsibility of executing Lee's strategical plan was placed on three men, Jackson, Longstreet, and Stewart. This concentration of authority was one reason for success. Another reason was the excellent logistics. Lee's troop movements had been prompt and rapid. It will be remembered that Longstreet had left the Richmond front to reinforce Jackson before the Federals had evacuated any except the sick and wounded from Harrison's Landing. While the first units of Porter's Corps were landing at Aquia Creek, the Army of Northern Virginia was crossing the Rapidan. Jackson was marching for Manassas as Franklin was hunting for transportation and waiting for cavalry around Alexandria. Longstreet was in line of battle when Porter marched on the field on the 29th. The race to Pope had been won, but three days' delay in sending Longstreet from Richmond or a wait of even 24 hours more in crossing the Rapidan might have made victory at 2nd Manassas impossible. On the other hand, greater speed in hurrying Franklin forward, cavalry or no cavalry, might have saved Pope. Delay in some stage of every campaign is of the very nature of war. The thrifty soldier saves by prompt starts and speedy moves the time he may later have to spend in delays he cannot avoid. Lee's strategic plan succeeded, thirdly, because at nearly every stage of the campaign his reasoning from his evidence was sounder than his adversaries. He had not known when Heinzelman joined Pope, nor had he been aware that Franklin and Sumner were debarking at Alexandria for their advance to the support of Pope. In neither of these instances, as it happened, was his lack of information costly. As for the essential facts, he had drawn the right conclusion concerning the movement and destination of McClellan's army and had been correct to the very day in his calculation of when Pope received his first substantial reinforcements from the Army of the Potomac. General Pope had not been so fortunate either in procuring news of the enemy's moves or in reading the mind of his opponent. His original plan had been to move to Gordonsville and Charlottesville and then to advance on Richmond from the west, but he had halted in a mistaken estimate of the strength of the troops Lee first sent to confront him. Not until August 18, it will be recalled, had he been aware of the threat against him. The import of the shift to the Confederate left had escaped him altogether. 
After he was relieved of command, on September 5, he professed that he had known all the while of Jackson's flank movement and had ignored it because he had relied on the promise of troops to protect Manassas, but his own correspondence shows that he had believed the Confederates were marching to the valley. When he had received accurate information of Jackson's position, sometime before noon on August 26, he had not drawn the proper inference. Apparently he had not learned of Longstreet's march to join Jackson until the 29th and his confused handling of his troops on the 27th and 28th had more than justified Lee's conservative observation that General Pope did not appear to be aware of his situation. No blame could be attached to the personnel of Pope's army or to the divisions from McClellan. They had borne themselves well. The Yankees fought as if in earnest, Lee's adjutant general wrote. The defeat, the withdrawal to Washington, and the temporary demoralization were essentially the result of Lee's good strategy, executed with rapidity. Only three reasonable criticisms can be made of Lee's handling of operations from the time he reached Gordonsville until the Federals disappeared from his front on the morning of September 2. The first, that he should have crossed the Rapidan earlier than the 20th, is based on the valid assumption that if he had been able to catch Pope between the Rapidan and the Rappahannock, he could have destroyed him. But this criticism leaves out of account the shortage of provisions, a subject about which, unfortunately, there is little specific information. Insofar as this criticism is applied solely to the failure of the cavalry to concentrate on the 17th of August, it takes for granted that if Fitzley had come up, the movement across the Rapidan could have been launched on the morning of the 18th. The facts already cited make it doubtful whether the horses would have been in condition for pursuit. The only way of assuring the advance at any time prior to the 20th, with horses fit for long, hard marching, would have been to move Fitzlee's cavalry from Hanover Courthouse not later than August 15, better still on August 14. This would not have been justified by the information Lee had. Viewed in another light, Lee's consideration for his horses was rewarded. Stuart was able to keep his troopers in the field until Pope retreated on Washington. Pope's cavalry, though numerous, well-led, and superior in every way to that which McClellan had commanded on the peninsula, was so overridden that it was almost useless by August 30. The second criticism is that Lee should have forced Longstreet to attack on the afternoon of August 29, instead of permitting him to delay until the 30th. Had Longstreet attacked successfully on the 29th, Lee would have been able to pursue on the 30th in clear weather, instead of having to encounter on the 31st a rain that paralyzed his army. The gain would have been substantial and might conceivably have resulted in very heavy losses to Pope. This criticism, to be sure, takes three things for granted, first, that an attack would certainly have been successful on the 29th, though Porter and McDowell were hovering on Lee's right flank, second, that the army would have been fresh enough on the 30th to pursue with vigor across Bull Run in the face of superior artillery, and, third, that the objections Longstreet raised to attacking on the 29th were of a sort that should have been overruled by the commanding general. All these points must be given due weight. Lee knew he was not omniscient and he did not believe he could be omnipresent. He held to his theory of the high command. Having put the army under the best officers at his disposal, he felt that on the field of battle he should trust their discretion. You must know our circumstances, Lee told a German observer, Skybert, and see that my leading in battle would do more harm than good. It would be a bad thing if I could not then rely on my brigade and division commanders. I plan and work with all my might to bring the troops to the right place at the right time, with that I have done my duty. As soon as I order the troops forward into battle, I lay the fate of my army in the hands of God. This is a sound general rule. In the study of war it is futile to canvas what cannot be decided, and for that reason it cannot positively be asserted that Lee should have given Longstreet a peremptory order to attack or would have been sure of a greater victory if he had. His yielding to Longstreet probably had a less disastrous effect on the battle than on the mind of that officer, it cost little, perhaps, at Second Manassas, but it cost much at Gettysburg. For it is a dire thing in war for a subordinate to believe that if he is stubborn enough in holding out against his superior's orders he can have his own way. There can be little doubt that after Second Manassas, Longstreet thought he could dominate Lee, and that added a new and indeterminable factor to the full execution of Lee's plans. On the other hand, Longstreet's judgment had been so good and his diligence had been so much above challenge during the seven days that Lee had acquired a high respect for him. 
as the wisdom of attacking on the afternoon of the 29th manifestly presented a close question, this respect for Longstreet's ability as a soldier undoubtedly weighed with Lee and saved his act from being mere weakness. Lee was more nearly justified in yielding to Longstreet at 2nd Manassas after the seven days than he could ever be after 2nd Manassas when dissent had become a habit with Longstreet. The third criticism is that Lee should have organized a prompt pursuit of Pope. In part, of course, the answer to this depends on the judgment one forms of the second criticism. If Lee should have compelled Longstreet to attack on the afternoon of the 29th, and if Longstreet had gained an advantage that afternoon without exhausting the army, then manifestly the whole of the army should have been moved in pursuit of Pope on the 30th. As it was, rapid pursuit on and after August 31st was impossible. The mud was paralyzing. Lee did not know, of course, that Franklin's and Sumner's corps, strong and fresh, were close at hand, but he did know that McClellan's army was coming up and he had every reason to assume that the Washington defenses were well-meant and strong. These circumstances and the hunger of his own men deterred him. Talking in 1870 with his cousin Cassius F. Lee, who lived near the fortifications on the south side of the Potomac, General Lee said in explanation of his failure to pursue, my men had nothing to eat. Pointing to Fort Wade, he went on, I could not tell my men to take that fort when they had had nothing to eat for three days. To have moved a hungry army through the mud against heavy defenses, readily manned, would have been to flirt with ruin. Behind these facts, compelling in themselves, was the large consideration of the purpose of the campaign of which Second Manassas was the second and not the final phase. Maneuver, his prime aim, was still possible if the army kept the field, but maneuver would be impossible and starvation might threaten if the army were committed to a siege at a long distance from its base. Lee's thought was of the next maneuver, not of a bootless investment of Washington, as he saw the rear guard of Pope's army fade into the horizon on the morning of September 2. Chapter 25, My Maryland, or His Lee's maneuvering after the Second Battle of Manassas had to be extensive and not a mere matter of shifting a few miles in this direction or in that, because Fairfax County, in which the army had halted, had already been stripped of food and of forage. The scant and overworked wagon train could not be relied upon to bring from Richmond an adequate supply of provisions, much less of horse feed. Likewise, maneuver had to be prompt. The Federals, Lee reasoned, had been weakened and demoralized by recent defeats, but his information was that 60,000 replacement troops had already been received at Washington and would soon be embodied. Quick action opened advantage and might deter the Federals from aggressive moves until the coming of winter, but delay would place in front of the Army of Northern Virginia a larger force than it had yet encountered. The weaker side could not wait. In this respect, September, 1862, was to Lee what March, 1918, was to Ludendorff. If maneuver had to be undertaken promptly in a country where the army could be subsisted, whither should it be directed? Not eastward, for that would carry the army under the very shadow of the Washington defenses. Not southward to any great distance, for that would take the army into a ravaged land and would bring the war back toward Richmond. Withdrawal a slight distance southward, to Warrington, for instance, might be considered. That would put the Army of Northern Virginia on the flank of any force advancing to Richmond and would give it the advantage of direct rail communication with the capital once the bridges across the Rapidan and the Rappahannock were reconstructed. Carrying the army westward would put it in the Shenandoah Valley, a terrain of many strategical possibilities, but one in which a retreat would force the army steadily back toward the line of the Virginia Central Railroad. By elimination, then, destiny beckoned northward, across the Potomac. And not by elimination only did Maryland and Pennsylvania invite the next stage of maneuver. They offered positive advantage. With Maryland occupied, Virginia would be free. No federal army based in Washington would dare advance on Richmond so long as Lee was north of the Potomac. Secure in western Maryland or in Pennsylvania, the Army of Northern Virginia would be able to harass if it might not destroy the Federals, and while the farmers of Virginia harvested their crops, untroubled by the enemy, Lee could await with equanimity the arrival of cold weather. Political, not less than military advantage seemed to be offered in Maryland. 
the South believed, from events which seemed to justify belief, that strong sentiment for the Confederacy existed in Maryland and would have exhibited itself in extensive volunteering and possible secession had it not been repressed with the overwhelming power of a federal government that was charged with brushing aside constitutional rights. What meant the Baltimore riots of April, 1861, if not this? Why had legislators and prominent private citizens been arrested and detained in defiance of habeas corpus? Was not the devoted service of the many Maryland soldiers in the Army of Northern Virginia a pledge of what thousands of others would do if opportunity were theirs? The presence of a large Confederate force above the Potomac, Lee reasoned, would not assure revolt against federal authority, but it would give the people of Maryland what they had never had, a chance to express their will. The possibility that invasion might lead to an uprising which would surround the northern capital by hostile territory would be an added reason why the Federals would not dare move south while the Confederate Army was north of the Potomac. There were risks, of course, in undertaking promptly an extensive maneuver for the sake of the military and political advantages that the occupation of Maryland and perhaps of Pennsylvania would offer. The Army was not equipped for it. Uniforms were in rags. Thousands of men were shoeless. The horses of many of the cavalrymen were so exhausted that they could not be employed in any forward movement. Scanty as was the train, it was apparent that some of the wagons would have to be left at Manassas to supplement the ambulances in evacuating the wounded. Ammunition must be replenished from Richmond, and if the line of supply was to be kept safe from federal raiders, it must of necessity be shifted westward to the district of the Shenandoah. The Federals were still in the lower valley, lingering at Winchester and garrisoning Harper's Ferry and Martinsburg, and would have to be driven out before a line of communications could be opened there, though it was reasonable to assume that when the army crossed into Maryland these posts would be evacuated. More serious than any of these military difficulties was the question of a legal method of procuring subsistence north of the Potomac. The rich valleys of Maryland were untroubled by war. On its well-stored cities, the hand of the quartermaster had never fallen. But could the army be fed in Maryland without recourse to wholesale seizures such as Pope had countenanced to the indignation of right-minded people, North and South? This aspect of the question stuck in Lee's mind. He discussed it with Longstreet, who reminded him that in Mexico the troops to which Longstreet had been attached had subsisted for three days on corn and green oranges. The corn was now ripening in the rows, Longstreet reminded him, and with roasting ears to feed them, the men would not starve. A final risk there was, of course, that from some unexpected quarter in some unanticipated way, the Federals might be able to throw a strong army to the James and capture Richmond. Lee regarded this, however, as more psychological than a military risk. The danger was less in the might of the enemy than in the mind of Mr. Davis. In addition to believing that the Potomac was the best line for the defense of the southern capital, General Lee hoped that the new ironclad Richmond, the second Merrimack, would soon be completed and would be able to clear the James of the enemy's fleet. With the river line close to the Federals, he considered the danger to Richmond slight. He could send troops back to the city as quickly as the enemy could march them thither. Weighing necessity, advantage, and risk in the scales of his judgment, Lee virtually decided on September 3 to enter Maryland, and that day he set the army in motion for Loudoun County, where he could feed it temporarily while threatening the Shenandoah Valley and debating further the advantages of an invasion of the North. The next day he was fully persuaded of the benefits to be gained, and wrote the President that he would proceed unless Mr. Davis disapproved. He was already looking, indeed, beyond Maryland, and he told the chief executive that if the results justified, he intended to enter Pennsylvania. If he were forced to fall back, Warrington was his second choice of a position, and with that place in mind he urged the prompt rebuilding of the railway bridges over the Rapidan and the Rappahannock. One important point remained to be settled, where should he enter Maryland, east of the Blue Ridge or west of it? His conclusion, promptly reached, was to advance east of the mountains, because this would be regarded by the Federals as a direct threat to Washington and to Baltimore. The administration, he reasoned, would at once call to the north of the Potomac all the forces operating on the south side of that river. This would remove all danger both to his supply line and to the troops collecting the arms and caring for the wounded on the field of Manassas. Having prompted the Federals to evacuate northern Virginia, he planned to move westward in Maryland to Hagerstown. 
There he would be on the straight road into Pennsylvania and in direct line with his communications up the Shenandoah Valley. These questions decided, the march into Loudoun County to provision the troops became merely a halt on the way to Maryland. The greater part of the Army of Northern Virginia moved on from Drainsville or Leesburg, where Lee, overwhelmed with social attentions, had his headquarters for two days, most of the time at the home of Henry Harrison. From Leesburg, the Army tramped to White's Ford on the Potomac, 11 miles south of Frederick. On September 5-6, the head of the columns prepared to cross the river. The drama of invasion lacked nearly all the stage properties calculated to impress observers with the might of conquest. There was no rehearsal on the South Bank, no pageant was shaped to fire the ardor of Marylanders. The first dusty troops to reach the Potomac halted, stripped, or pulled frayed trouser legs high over aching knees and plunged into the shallow water of the Boundary River. As they clambered up the northern bank, they cheered in the proud knowledge that they had carried the war into the enemy's country. The few and battered bands played Maryland, my Maryland, and the soldiers cheered the more. They were confident of their ability to win new victories, confident of their cause, and confident of their commander. The country people seemed glad to see them, but they must have wondered how such an army could have won the victories blazoned on its faded flags. Lank and lagging horses bore tattered riders ahead of its ragged columns of dirty, unshaven, and cadaverous infantrymen needed nothing but the well-tended rifles they carried. Scarcely a shining button or a trim uniform was to be seen, even in brigades the very names of whose officers had the ring of iron discipline. Hats hung in battered brims, shocks of hair stuck through the holes, caps had lost their color. Toes gaped from flapping shoes and naked feet limped in protest at the hardness of Maryland's stony roads. Smoke-covered caissons rattled, dilapidated wagons groaned, the worn wheels that carried the lean guns of the artillery complained. Men who had beheld the army in the mud of the Chickahominy Valley and in the dust of the road to Thoroughfare Gap had to confess that never had they seen it so filthy, so ragged, or so ill-provided for. Ireland in her worst straits, one federal correspondent wrote in disgust, could present no parallel. A boy who saw them march by remembered, they were the dirtiest men I ever saw, a most ragged, lean, and hungry set of wolves. Yet there was a dash about them that the northern men lacked. They rode like circus riders. Many of them were from the far south and spoke a dialect I could scarcely understand. They were profane beyond belief and talked incessantly. As Lee himself approached the river, after the first troops had passed over, he came upon some of Hill's troops, prone in the road, awaiting their turn. A P. Hill was with him at the time, and he said, Move out of the road, men. Never mind, General, Lee broke in immediately, we will ride around them. Lie still, men. And he turned his horse out of the road. Once in Maryland, Lee rode with the infantry straight for Frederick, within two miles of which he established his headquarters on September 7. His tents were pitched near those of Longstreet, in a beautiful grove of oaks, which soon became the objective of many curious visitors. The more outspoken Southern sympathizers showered him with invitations, which he declined. It would go hard with his hosts, he explained, after the army moved on and it became known that they had entertained him. He made only one exception, so far as is known. Going to dinner in a private home, he found among the guests a very young and exceedingly bashful corporal of the Rockbridge Artillery. The gilded staff officers ignored this young man from the ranks, but the general went up to him, put a crippled hand on his shoulder, and spoke with pride of the fine service the boy's battery had rendered. The first impressions made by the army on the people of Maryland were not wholly unfavorable. Firm discipline was enjoined on the army. Sentinels were posted at the stores in Frederick, and the soldiers were forbidden to enter the town, though many of them contrived to purchase necessities with Confederate money and soon began to take on a less bedraggled appearance. Those who had to march through the town had a varied reception. Some women brought out food, others held their noses and waved the Union flag. Dispositions were made promptly. The cavalry was stationed at Urbana, seven miles southeast of Frederick, on the main road to Washington. The infantry and artillery were encamped around Frederick, with the exception of Early's division, which was moved a few miles southward with instructions to destroy the bridge over the Monocacy River at the junction of the main line of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad with the branch to Frederick. 
It was known that McClellan had replaced Pope in general command, and that was not pleasant news, for Lee regarded McClellan as the ablest of the federal commanders, but there were no signs of any advance on the part of the restored leader. The populace showed no disposition to rise, though making no resistance to the purchase of supplies, which for a few days were to be had in abundance. Lee's plan was to wait at Frederick until the people showed their sentiments or until McClellan appeared in his front, and he hoped for the arrival of ex-Governor Enoch L. Lowe of Maryland, an ardent Southern supporter, who was believed to have great influence with the people of that part of the state. Governor Lowe not arriving, Lee decided to issue a proclamation to the people of Maryland. This appeared on September 8 and read as follows. It is right that you should know the purpose that brought the army under my command within the limits of your state, so far as that purpose concerns yourselves. The people of the Confederate States have long watched with the deepest sympathy the wrongs and outrages that have been inflicted upon the citizens of a Commonwealth allied to the states of the South by the strongest social, political, and commercial ties. They have seen with profound indignation their sister state deprived of every right and reduced to the condition of a conquered province. Under the pretense of supporting the Constitution, but in violation of its most valuable provisions, your citizens have been arrested and imprisoned upon no charge and contrary to all forms of law. The faithful and manly protest against this outrage made by the venerable and illustrious Marylanda, to whom in better days no citizen appealed for right in vain, was treated with scorn and contempt, the government of your chief city has been usurped by armed strangers, your legislature has been dissolved by the unlawful arrest of its members, freedom of the press and of speech has been suppressed. Words have been declared offenses by an arbitrary decree of the federal executive and citizens ordered to be tried by a military commission for what they may dare to speak. Believing that the people of Maryland possessed a spirit too lofty to submit to such a government, the people of the South have long wished to aid you in throwing off this foreign yoke, to enable you again to enjoy the inalienable rights of freemen and restore independence and sovereignty to your state. In obedience to this wish, our army has come among you and is prepared to assist you with the power of its arms in regaining the rights of which you have been despoiled. This, citizens of Maryland, is our mission, so far as you are concerned. No constraint upon your free will is intended, no intimidation will be allowed within the limits of this army, at least. Marylanders shall once more enjoy their ancient freedom of thought and speech. We know no enemies among you, and will protect all, of every opinion. It is for you to decide your destiny freely and without constraint. This army will respect your choice, whatever it may be, and while the southern people will rejoice to welcome you to your natural position among them, they will only welcome you when you come of your own free will. R. E. Lee General, Commanding Lee looked to something more than recruits. It seemed to him that the military situation had been so changed that the Confederacy should make a peace proposal based on the recognition of its independence. On the day that he issued his statement to the people of Maryland, he suggested to the president a move to this end. Such a proposition, he wrote, coming from us at this time, could in no way be regarded as suing for peace, but, being made when it is in our power to inflict injury upon our adversary, would show conclusively to the world that our sole object is the establishment of our independence and the attainment of an honorable peace. The rejection of this offer would prove to the country that the responsibility of the continuance of the war does not rest upon us, but that the party in power in the United States elect to prosecute it for purposes of their own. The proposal of peace would enable the people of the United States to determine at their coming elections whether they will support those who favor a prolongation of the war, or those who wish to bring it to a termination, which can but be productive of good to both parties without affecting the honor of either. This was Lee's first and almost last adventure in foreign relations while in the Army of the Confederacy. It proved futile because of the quick turn of events, but it was prompted by a desire to see the end of a war that wrung his heart, and it illustrates his confidence at the time that nothing was likely to happen to his army that would make a move for peace appear as the plea of a beaten people. There were, indeed, only two circumstances that seemed in any wise to cast doubt on the continued ability of Lee to maneuver in Maryland and in Pennsylvania as he had in northern Virginia. One of these was the unexpected development of a dangerous degree of straggling in the army. Many of the men were accustomed in civil life to ride on horseback and very rarely to walk. The constant marching and hard fighting of August had exhausted hundreds of faithful soldiers, particularly those whose shoes had worn out. 
Bruised feet could not long endure the pace that had carried the army from the Rapidan to the Monocacy in eighteen days. Some there were who had been ardent in battling for their homes, yet were unwilling to wage offensive warfare against the North. Lee had brought only some 53,000 troops into Maryland, and he was deeply concerned to see his ranks thinning. He promptly appealed to the President for the appointment of a military commission to move with army and to act through a strong provost marshal's guard. The other evil portent was the approaching exhaustion of supplies in the country around Frederick. Lee could not supplement them adequately by maintaining his line of communications via Culpeper Courthouse because that line was so much exposed to attack from the direction of Washington that he was already preparing to abandon it. When he carried out his original plan and moved westward to Hagerstown, he would still have no guarantee of sufficient food for his army and would have to draw from Virginia, whence, also, his ammunition must come. His proposed new line would run down the Shenandoah Valley directly by Martinsburg and within 16 miles of Harper's Ferry. And there was the rub. Winchester had been occupied by the Confederates on September 3, but the Federals were still at Harper's Ferry and at Martinsburg in strength. The desirability of reducing these posts had suggested itself strongly to Lee during the early stages of the advance into Maryland, even when it seemed probable that both would be evacuated as soon as McClellan knew that the Army of Northern Virginia was in Maryland. Longstreet, however, had argued so warmly against a division of force that Lee had determined to wait and see if the Federals would not voluntarily abandon the towns. Now there seemed no alternative to sending a force to take them. Nor did the risk seem greater, in dealing with a deliberate opponent like McClellan, than the risk that the weaker army always must take to win advantage. By every test of known temperament and previous behavior, McClellan would organize thoroughly before advancing at all, and then would move so slowly and cautiously that the troublesome posts could be taken and the detached forces returned to the army at Boonesboro or at Hagerstown before a battle had to be fought, if, indeed, one could not be avoided altogether. Once the army was reunited and its line of communications clear, dazzling possibilities of maneuver would open. The Baltimore and Ohio Railroad could be held or destroyed, and the army could move from Hagerstown to Harrisburg, a distance of only 71 miles. West of Harrisburg, the Susquehanna Bridge of the Pennsylvania Railroad could be broken. Then the east would be cut off from the west, except for the slow and circuitous route by the Great Lakes. Lee would be left free to deal with McClellan, assured that no reinforcements could reach his adversary from the West. A march on Philadelphia, Baltimore, or Washington would be practicable, and the war might be won. Such an opportunity justified the danger incident to dividing the army. If Harper's Ferry and Martinsburg were to be cleared of Federals before these great maneuvers were undertaken, then Jackson was the man to do the work. He was perfectly familiar with the country by reason of his long service there. Lee called him to headquarters, on or about September 9, closed the flap of his tent and began a discussion of the best way to accomplish his object. While they were talking, Longstreet's voice was heard outside. Lee immediately invited him to share their counsel. Longstreet was not sympathetic with the project and sulked at the decision, but as he saw it had been determined upon, he made no other suggestion than that, if Jackson should be detached, the remainder of the army should be kept together. Harper's Ferry, as already noted, is one of the most vulnerable of positions. Lying on the west bank of the Shenandoah, at the junction of that stream with the Potomac, it is in a flat dominated from three directions. In rear of the town stand the Boulevard Heights. Eastward, across the Shenandoah, rise the Loudoun Heights. From the northward, on the other side of the Potomac, the lofty Maryland Heights look down. From any one of these positions artillery could rake the town and make it untenable. But if the garrison was to be captured along with the place the task was not easy. An enemy attacked from the Virginia side could escape across the Potomac Bridge. Assailed from the Maryland side and from Bolivar Heights, a vigilant commander could slip a short distance up the Shenandoah from Harper's Ferry to Fords, which offered a retreat to the Loudoun Heights. Lee reasoned that the garrison should be taken along with the post, and to effect this he had to close all the exits by organizing three columns to converge simultaneously, one on Loudoun Heights, one on Maryland Heights, and one from the rear of Harper's Ferry on Bolivar Heights. The last of these three columns could readily force the federal troops at Martinsburg to retreat to the ferry. 
For the occupation of Loudoun Heights, Lee chose the small but fresh division of Brigadier General John G. Walker, who had come from Richmond with D. H. Hill. To seize Maryland Heights from the north, a troublesome advance through a very difficult country, he selected McClaws's and R. H. Anderson's divisions of Longstreet's command. And for the most serious part of the work, cutting off the retreat of the garrison from in rear of Harper's Ferry so that it would surrender to McClaws, Lee designated the whole of Jackson's left wing of the army. As he moved forward, Jackson could tear up the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. Each of these forces was carefully proportioned to the nature and magnitude of the task assigned it. Walker's line of advance would carry him close by the mouth of the Monocacy River, which the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal crossed. This aqueduct of the canal could be demolished en route so as to destroy that line of communication with the West. That Walker might know precisely what was expected of him, Lee summoned him to headquarters, went over the plan in detail, with a map before them, and then told him of his intention to march from Hagerstown to Harrisburg. Walker could not conceal his astonishment. Lee observed it. You doubtless regard it hazardous to leave McClellan practically on my line of communication and to march into the heart of the enemy's country? Walker had to admit that it seemed so to him. Are you acquainted with General McClellan? Lee inquired. Walker had served with McClellan in Mexico but had not been close to him since that time. He is an able general, Lee said, but a very cautious one. His enemies among his own people think him too much so. His army is in a very demoralized and chaotic condition and will not be prepared for offensive operations, or he will not think it so, for three or four weeks. Before that time, I hope to be on the Susquehanna. No time was to be lost in launching the enterprise. The main army was to be moving toward Hagerstown while the detached columns were on their mission. The work of destroying the Baltimore and Ohio and the canal was to be an integral part of operations against Harper's Ferry, but was to be preliminary to it. Harper's Ferry itself was to be captured Friday, September 12th. Then the army would be ready to reconcentrate at Hagerstown or at Boonesboro and to advance into Pennsylvania. All these details were covered by Special Orders No. 191, issued on September 9 and destined to have a memorable place in American military history. Copies were made at General Headquarters for all those division commanders who were to participate in the movement, and as D. H. Hill was not formally attached either to Jackson's or to Longstreet's wing, the text was delivered directly to him from General Headquarters. Jackson, however, had never been notified that D. H. Hill had been taken from under his control, so he also sent the paper to that officer. This copy from Jackson Hill carefully preserved. The other, being superfluous, was used by some staff officer of Hills, the world will never know by whom, to wrap up three cigars against the time when the owner should want them. It was to prove the costliest covering ever used for such a purpose. The routes set forth in these orders were as follows. 1. Jackson in advance, Frederick to Middletown to Sharpsburg, passing the Potomac at a fort of his selection, taking possession of the Baltimore and Ohio on the morning of September 12, capturing Martinsburg and cutting off the retreat of the enemy from Harper's Ferry. 2. McClaws, with R. H. Anderson, Frederick to Middletown to Harper's Ferry, occupying the Maryland Heights on Friday morning, September 12, and endeavoring to capture the garrison there. 3. Walker, to complete the destruction of the Monocacy Aqueduct, then across the Potomac at Cheeks Ford, to occupy Loudoun Heights. 4. Longstreet, with part of the wagon trains, Frederick, to Boonesboro. 5. D. H. Hill, preceded by the rest of the wagon trains and the reserve artillery, to follow Longstreet as a rear guard. 6. Stewart, detaching a squadron each for the columns of Jackson, Longstreet, and McClaws to cover the route of the army and to round up all stragglers. 7. All movements to begin the morning of September 10. 8. Jackson, McClaws, and Walker, on completion of their mission, to rejoin at Boonesboro or at Hagerstown. Graphically, the actual routes, slightly modified from those set forth in the orders, were as follows. At the designated time, the march began. Lee remained with Longstreet until time for that officer to move and then rode westward with him. The advance carried him through a quiet, rolling country toward South Mountain. 
This low and beautiful range, running almost with the meridian at this point, is part of the familiar Blue Ridge chain in Virginia and forms an impressive barrier between Frederick and Hagerstown. As the veterans of Longstreet's hard-hitting brigades passed through Turner's Gap in the mountains, reminiscent of the highlands through which they had tramped to Manassas, every soldier must have reflected that the nearby heights would make a good fortress from which to defy McClellan. But as Lee expected the speedy conclusion of the Harper's Ferry expedition, he had no thought of holding the mountain pass. On the contrary, it seemed more to his advantage to draw McClellan westward beyond the range so that he would have to negotiate it in victualling his army. At the least, Lee intended to move on to Boonesboro, two miles and a half from the crest of the mountains. From that point, he could observe the progress of the operations against Harper's Ferry and could advance quickly if the Federals at the ferry eluded McClaws and tried to join McClellan. Before the 10th of September ended, a rumor reached Lee that a Federal force was moving southward on Hagerstown from the direction of Chambersburg, Penna. This had not been reckoned upon. If it were a fact, the Federals could cross in front of Lee's column and play havoc with his communications or interrupt the operations against Harper's Ferry. Hagerstown must be secured. Longstreet was therefore directed to proceed thither the next day, instead of remaining at Boonesboro. Lee was loath, however, to abandon altogether the strategic position at Boonesboro until he was certain that the Federals at Harper's Ferry had been bagged, for there was no other point from which he could move so quickly toward Harper's Ferry in case of emergency. Besides, Stuart might need infantry support closer than Hagerstown. Reasoning in this way, Lee determined to leave D. H. Hill at Boonesboro while Longstreet went on to Hagerstown. This meant splitting the army into five detachments, Jackson en route to Martinsburg, McClaws moving toward Maryland Heights, Walker on his way to Loudoun Heights, Longstreet advancing to Hagerstown, and D. H. Hill remaining at Boonesboro, while the cavalry, as yet, was east of South Mountain. Still, so long as McClellan lingered under the shelter of the Washington defenses, a dispersion of force that violated all the canons of war might serve the needs of the situation and involve no undue risks. Lee rode on with Longstreet to Hagerstown on the 11th. He found no signs of any federal advance from Pennsylvania and nothing to create alarm. The reception of the army was more sympathetic than at Frederick, but the stiffest discipline was maintained among the men for the protection of hostile civilians in accordance with the spirit of Lee's proclamation. When a woman insisted on singing the star-spangled banner under his very nose as he rode through the town, Lee lifted his hat to her and gave orders that nobody was to molest her in any way. In the towns and from the country round about some supplies were procured, but no bacon was to be had. The advantage of maintaining the supply lines south of the Potomac seemed more apparent than ever, for it was certain Lee would have to continue to draw provisions from Virginia. The Twelfth did not bring the news of the capture of Harper's Ferry that Lee had hoped to receive. Instead, Stuart reported through D. H. Hill that the enemy was advancing on Frederick. Except that a part of Burnside's corps was included, Stuart was unable to say what strength the Federals had. This intelligence was most disquieting. Why was the deliberate federal commander on the move? He who was so careful to prepare everything in advance, how could he be stirring, much less pushing boldly forward, so soon after the defeat at Manassas? McClellan was not running true to form. What had happened to him? The next morning, September 13, there was still no information of the capture of Harper's Ferry. Jackson was known to have reached Martinsburg, whence the federal garrison, estimated at 2,500 to 3,500, was said to have fled to Harper's Ferry. Stonewall was expected to be in front of the latter position by noon of the 13th, but McClaws had not sent Lee a word concerning his progress. As it was reasonable to suppose that the advancing Federals had occupied Frederick, Lee warned McClaws to watch the road from Frederick to Harper's Ferry. The outlook was vaguely darkening. Lee was increasingly conscious of the weakness produced by straggling. In answer to a letter from Davis, who proposed to visit the army, Lee wrote, So much depends upon circumstances beyond the army's control and the aid that we may receive, that it is difficult for me to conjecture the result. To look to the safety of our own frontier and to operate untrammeled in an enemy's territory, you need not be told, is very difficult. Every effort, however, will be made to acquire every advantage which our position and means may warrant. 
During the evening of the 13th, intelligence arrived that justified, and more than justified, the cautious tone of this dispatch. Through D. H. Hill, who outranked him, Stewart reported the alarming news that the Federals at 2 p.m. had driven him from the gap in the Catoctin Mountains, a minor range that lay about seven miles east of South Mountain. McClellan, still contrary to all expectation, was pushing on, and shrewdly. For the gap from which Stewart had been forced by the enemy was on the road from Frederick to Boonesboro. Once the enemy covered the distance from the Catoctin Gap to Turner's Gap, in South Mountain, the whole situation would be changed. The Federals would be in rear of McClaws on the Maryland Heights and he might be compelled to retreat quickly to escape capture. If the Federals still held out at Harper's Ferry when McClaws was forced to retire, they might cross the Potomac Bridge and join the main Union Army. Lee would then have to face McClellan, with Jackson and Walker detached and with McClaws's fate uncertain. It was a prospect so serious that there was but one thing to do, to hurry D. H. Hill back to South Mountain, which Lee had not intended to defend, and to hold off McClellan at that point until Harper's Ferry fell or McClaws, at the least, was out of danger. The situation is shown on page 368. Lee at once dispatched a messenger to D. H. Hill with orders to defend Turner's Gap. Longstreet was called to headquarters and arrived while Lee was studying his map. He told Old Pete of the state of affairs and, after discussing it, instructed him to leave Toombs at Hagerstown with one brigade as a guard for the trains and with the rest of his command to march at daylight the next morning, September 14, to support D. H. Hill. This did not appeal to Longstreet. Arguing that his troops would arrive at the Gap too tired to make any effective defense, he insisted that the proper course was to withdraw to Sharpsburg and to reconcentrate all the army there. Lee listened, but this time he did not yield to Longstreet. On a question of strategy, rather than of combat, he held to his opinion, doubtless because he did not feel it wise to leave McClaws unprotected against an attack on his rear from South Mountain. At 10 p.m., Lee sent warning to McClaws of his danger. He urged him to proceed with all speed to take Harper's Ferry and then, if he received no contrary orders from Jackson, to move as rapidly as possible to Sharpsburg, where he would be out of danger. Later in the night, after Longstreet had left, Lee received from him a note again urging that the defense of South Mountain be not attempted, but that the army be moved to Sharpsburg. Lee did not change his plan. In the darkest uncertainty as to the situation, Lee on the morning of the 14th renewed his instructions to McClaws and told him of the position of the other troops. Stewart, he said, with support from D. H. Hill, was holding Turner's Gap and Munford and Hampton, with their cavalry, were at Crampton's Gap in South Mountain, seven miles south of Turner's Gap. This dispatch sent off, Lee joined Longstreet in his advance to the support of D. H. Hill at South Mountain. He was able by this time to ride Traveler again, but he could not use the reins sufficiently to guide him over rough ground, though he had become so weary of the ambulance that he would no longer use it. As the column approached the mountain, D. H. Hill could be heard, furiously engaged. Ere long there came a dispatch from Hill to Longstreet asking that the reinforcements come forward with all speed, as he was hard-pressed by a greatly superior force. Lee joined with the subordinate officers in urging the men to quicken their march. About three o'clock, just after he had passed Boonesboro, Lee drew to the side of the road and watched the men go into action. Soon the Texas Brigade passed by. It was ready for a fight, but it had a grievance because its commander, General John B. Hood, had been put under arrest at Manassas for insubordination growing out of a quarrel with General N. G. Evans over some captured ambulances. Give us Hood, the Texans yelled, as they saw the commanding general. Lee raised his hat. You shall have him, gentlemen. Presently Hood came up, he had been permitted to remain with his command, Lee sent for him. General, he said, here I am just upon the eve of entering into battle, and with one of my best officers under arrest. If you will merely say that you regret this occurrence, I will release you and restore you to the command of your division. Hood stoutly refused and began to argue his case. Lee pressed him, Hood stood out. Well, said Lee, I will suspend your arrest till the impending battle is decided. Hood rode off. His men received him with a shout and filed off to the right of the road to take position. Reinforcements had not come an hour too soon for Hill's necessity. 
He had been fighting since early in the morning with five small brigades against a much stronger force in a position of extreme difficulty. Overlooking the northern side of Turner's Gap there are two high ridges, one to the east and one to the west. Two similar ridges dominate the gap from the south. On the Confederate left, as the troops faced eastward, the old Hagerstown Road mounted a ravine about a mile from the main highway and then ran along the crest back to the pass. On the Confederate right, the former Sharpsburg Road paralleled the highway and then turned to the southwest. There were in addition two other rough roads up the mountainside, a total of five including the main highway, that Hill had been required to defend. Placing roads on the left, with Colquitt astride the main road, he had stationed G. B. Anderson and Ripley on the right to support Garland's brigade, which had been thrown in early and had been demoralized after its commander had been killed in a most brilliant defense. The right had held thereafter, but at the time Longstreet came up it was evident that the Federals were massing heavily to turn the Confederate left, maintained with much stubbornness and skill by Rhodes's brigade. Lee sent his staff officers forward to ascertain the situation and place the reserve artillery as it came up, but in his crippled condition he did not attempt to direct the battle. Longstreet took it in hand without consulting D. H. Hill and threw in his troops before he familiarized himself with the terrain. In a short time Longstreet sent back word to Lee to prepare to retire that night as it would not be possible to hold South Mountain against the forces then pressing forward. The troops, however, were determined not to yield their ground before darkness came to their relief. D. R. Jones and Evans on the left, and Hood on the right, gallantly seconded Hill's men in contesting obstinately every foot of the rough mountain, weary though they were from their hurried march. On the right, the situation was stabilized, on the left, Rhodes was driven back on his supports, but with Colquitt's aid and some assistance from Longstreet's men, he was able to keep the enemy from the main road. When nightfall ended this Battle of South Mountain, as it was subsequently called, some 1,800 Confederates and the like number of Federals lay dead or wounded on the ridges, and the greater part of Garland's brigades had been captured. The Federal lines extended beyond both flanks of the Confederates. It was manifest that unless the Army of Northern Virginia was reinforced, the pass would be stormed the next morning. And there was no prospect of reinforcement. The hours that followed were among the most anxious Lee had known. Never before in his campaigning had the situation changed so often or so perplexingly as between dark on the 14th and dawn on the 15th, rarely thereafter did the events of any ten hours present so many contradictions. Lee looked squarely at the facts, the day had been bad, the morrow might be worse. The enemy's advance through the mountains would put him directly in rear of McClaws. The Federals at Harper's Ferry, across the Potomac from McClaws, would command the bridge if they still held out in the face of Jackson's and Walker's attack. Longstreet, Hill, and Stewart might be able to keep McClellan off McClaws's rear for a few hours, but they could not succor him. McClaws must get across the Potomac as soon as possible by some ford that the Federals did not command. There was no alternative. McClaws's retreat, however, would leave only the three divisions and the few scattered brigades then with Lee on the north side of the Potomac to contend alone against the full strength of the army of McClellan on the 15th in hopeless numerical inferiority. All the high hopes of maneuver had to be abandoned. All the air castles that had been built around Harrisburg and the Susquehanna Bridge had to be vacated. The Army of Northern Virginia, being unable to reconcentrate on the north side of the Potomac, must seek the friendly soil on the south side of the river and await a new opportunity. So reasoned Lee. At 8 p.m. he dictated this dispatch to McClaws and sent it off at once by courier. General, the day has gone against us and this army will go by Sharpsburg and cross the river. It is necessary for you to abandon your position tonight. Center trains not required on the road to cross the river. Your troops you must have well in hand to unite with this command, which will retire by Sharpsburg. Send forward officers to explore the way, ascertain the best crossing of the Potomac, and if you can find any between you and Shepherdstown leave the Shepherdstown Ford for this command. Send an officer to report to me on the Sharpsburg Road, where you are and what crossing you will take. You will of course bring Anderson's division with you. Then Longstreet and D. H. Hill arrived with their reports of the situation at the end of the battle. Hood came also. Their opinion was unanimously in concurrence with that which Lee had already formed, the army must retreat. 
It could not hold South Mountain the next day. Lee did not tell his subordinates that he intended to recross the Potomac at once. Perhaps he deemed it best to withhold announcement of that unpleasant necessity from men who were weary from the strain of battle. They left with no other instruction than that they were to march to Centerville on the road to Sharpsburg. Though they would be able to give some measure of temporary protection to McClaws's rear. Fitz Lee's brigade of cavalry would cover the retreat. Not long after this council of war, bad news confirmed Lee's decision to withdraw, the Confederate cavalry sent to defend Crampton's Gap had lost it, the Federals were pouring through directly in McClaws's rear. This, of course, aggravated the danger of McClaws being cut off. More than that, it gave the enemy a short and direct road to Sharpsburg, past which town Lee expected to move on his way back to Virginia soil. The army manifestly must lose no time in reaching Centerville, both to protect McClaws and to guard its own line of retreat. On the heels of the messenger bringing this grim news of the occupation of Crampton's Gap, a report from Jackson reached headquarters. It was not specific in promise, that was not Jackson's way, but it led Lee to believe that Harper's Ferry would fall the next morning. That suggested a possibility of retrieving the situation. If Jackson took Harper's Ferry, his orders were to rejoin the army and he could be counted on to do so promptly, perhaps at Sharpsburg, which was only 12 miles from Harper's Ferry by the most direct road. If, moreover, McClaws could find a way out of his trap and, instead of marching into Virginia, could also get to Sharpsburg, the army could be reunited on the north side of the Potomac and might be able to resume its campaign of maneuver. It was, however, a prospect that hung on many contingencies, and if the gamble were lost, then the army must return to Virginia and must secure the fords as a precaution. With this analysis of the situation, Lee issued instructions as follows. 1. The main army was to march to Centerville to protect McClaws's rear, as decided at the Council of War, and to cover the road to Sharpsburg. 2. McClaws was to cross into Virginia if he must, but was to seek a road over the mountains or follow the road up the river, and if he could march on Sharpsburg, was to notify headquarters, which would be established at Centerville. 3. The cavalry that had fought at Crampton's Gap were to cover McClaws's rear, holding Rowersville on the main road from Boonesboro to Maryland Heights, and were to assist McClaws in finding a road to Sharpsburg. 4. Jackson's and Walker's orders to rejoin the army were to stand. 5. One battalion of reserve artillery was to remain with the army at Centerville, the rest was to recross the Potomac at once and cover the fords in case a retreat across the river became necessary. These decisions did not end the responsibilities of a night of foreboding. Rumors spread from the outposts on the mountain that the Federals were withdrawing. For a moment Lee hesitated over his own retreat, but fortunately a prisoner was brought in who stated that Sumner's corps was coming into position, fresh for an attack with the dawn. This confirmed Lee in his decision. The army was set in motion, preceded by the wagon trains. The dead and the seriously wounded had to be left behind. On the road, Lee sent another urgent note to McClaws, from whom he had heard nothing and to whom he doubted if his earlier messages had been delivered. He told McClaws to move to Harper's Ferry if it had fallen by the time McClaws received his dispatch. Then, making still another change of plan, Lee decided it would be better to march direct to Sharpsburg than to halt at Centerville. He reasoned that if his main force were at Sharpsburg he would be able to render McClaws almost as much assistance as at Centerville, if McClaws, meantime, had not crossed to Harper's Ferry. The remainder of the army could be stationed on good ground at Sharpsburg. Further, the columns could more readily be transferred from that point than from Centerville to the south bank of the Potomac in case Stonewall and the other commanders of detached columns could not reach Lee in time. As the army marched at daylight to the low hills around the undistinguished little town of Sharpsburg, which it was to make forever renowned, these alternatives, then, must have been uppermost in Lee's mind, was it retreat or maneuver that awaited him, a bloody anticlimax to the seven days into Manassas, or a new success? Chapter 26, With Eyes on the Harper's Ferry Road Sharpsburg appeared in the morning light of September 15, 1862, as a quiet, substantially built little town lying under one of a series of ridges between the sluggish Antietam Creek and the winding Potomac. The course of the river is from north to south until it reaches a point about three miles southwest of Sharpsburg, where it turns almost directly east. The meandering Antietam runs almost due south into the river. 
the average depth of position between the creek and the river is about three miles. The ground Lee had chosen for his concentration was thus a peninsula between the Antietam and the Potomac, reasonably strong but dangerously shallow in case of disaster. In rear of it was only one good ford, about a mile and a half below Shepherdstown. Slowly and doggedly Longstreet's and D.H. Hill's divisions tramped down from Centerville, by way of the Boonesboro and Sharpsburg Road, crossed the creek, and took positions on either side of the road. Their first dispositions were nearly parallel to the Antietam and east of the town. All the morning the dusty veterans moved toward the town and turned to right and to left before they reached it. Lee personally helped to put the last of them into position. We will make our stand on those hills, he said, as he told the men where to go. They were only 18,000, all told, such had been the price of Lee's dispersion of force, and they seemed a pitifully small command with which to face the army they knew was in pursuit. Most of the soldiers were hungry, too, for the commissary had broken down, and few rations were to be had by the roadside. About noon a courier galloped up the road from Shepherdstown and came to Lee's temporary quarters. He brought a message from Jackson, written in the familiar, unsoldierly handwriting of Stonewall. General Lee broke the seal and read. Near 8 a.m., September 15, 1862. General, through God's blessing, Harper's Ferry and its garrison are to be surrendered. As Hill's troops have borne the heaviest part in the engagement, he will be left in command until the prisoners and public property shall be disposed of, unless you direct otherwise. The other forces can move off this evening, so soon as they get their rations. To what place shall they move? I write at this time in order that you may be apprised of the condition of things. You may expect to hear from me again today after I get more information respecting the number of prisoners, etc. Respectfully. T. J. Jackson. Major General. That is indeed good news, said Lee, let it be announced to the troops. Quickly the word was passed, the men seemed charged with new courage when they heard it. The worst danger from the division of the army would soon be over, for Lee, of course, immediately ordered Jackson's stout-hearted brigades to rejoin the main army as soon as possible. McClaws and Walker, likewise relieved from detached duty by the capture of Harper's Ferry, would also proceed promptly to Sharpsburg. This prospect of an early reconcentration of his whole army seemed to answer the question Lee had asked himself at dawn. He could now afford to invite attack on the Maryland side and need not forego the advantage of prospective maneuver in the enemy's country or take a chance of losing what Jackson had captured at Harper's Ferry. Lee was over his map at 2 p.m., studying troop positions and roads, when a message from Fitz Lee advised him that the enemy was approaching the Antietam. Soon the Union troops began to appear. Steadily through the afternoon, moving clouds of dust, far-off flags and glimpses of blue on distant hills showed that the Federals were coming up in great strength. They made no attack, however. Only their fine, long-range artillery warned the Confederates of what was in store for them. Lee watched guns and moving columns with apparent unconcern. So confident was Lee of this that he did not hesitate to express the opinion that the next day would pass without a battle. Before the 15th ended, Stuart the ubiquitous rode over from Harper's Ferry with fuller news of what had befallen Jackson. He had a tale to tell of successes that more than counterbalanced the losses at South Mountain. Moving by Williamsport, Lights Ford, and Martinsburg, Jackson had come in sight of Bolivar Heights, in rear of Harper's Ferry, about 11 a.m. on the 13th, Walker had failed to destroy the aqueduct at the mouth of the Monocacy but had reached Loudoun Heights on the afternoon of the 13th. McClaws had encountered some opposition from the strong federal positions on Maryland Heights but had managed to get his troops on the crest by 4.30 p.m. the same day. On the 14th Jackson had made his dispositions very skillfully and had seized commanding ground behind the town. McClaws had been gravely threatened that day when the Federals had broken through Crampton's Gap, but with some help from Stuart he had drawn his lines to face the enemy in his rear. He had been in as instant danger as Lee had supposed on the night of the 14th, but fortunately he had not been pushed. By the morning of the 15th, the Federals at Harper's Ferry had been so completely under the southern artillery that the garrison had surrendered. Only a small cavalry command had escaped. More than 11,000 men, 73 guns, about 13,000 small arms, and vast miscellaneous stores had been captured. 
When Stuart had left, the way had been clear for McClaws to cross to Harper's Ferry. As the garrison at Martinsburg had fled to Harper's Ferry and had been included in the capitulation, the line of communications via the Shenandoah Valley was clear, the roads were open, and the detached units could rejoin the Army of Northern Virginia as soon as they could cover the ground from Harper's Ferry to Sharpsburg. The situation was immensely bettered. But for the rapid and unexplained advance of the Federals, all Lee's misgivings of the night of the 14th to 15th would have been dissipated by the news Stuart brought, and the campaign of maneuver could have swept northward according to the original plan. Refreshed by sound sleep, Lee on the morning of September 16 exhibited no fear of the fast-swelling mass of Federals in front of him. If he had had a well-equipped army of 100,000 veterans at his back, wrote a comrade who saw him that day, he could not have appeared more composed and confident. He had as yet only the 18,000 infantry who had marched from South Mountain. The great bends of the Potomac behind his lines were like the coils of a snake waiting to envelop him. But not once did he hint of any withdrawal across the Potomac. He had to allow time for the removal of the booty taken at Harper's Ferry, he was dealing with a cautious adversary who had never yet fought an offensive battle, he would soon have to gather all the units of an unbeaten army that had established its superiority over Pope's greater host only a little more than a fortnight before. A quick withdrawal in the face of his proclamation to the people of Maryland would mean the definite and probably the permanent loss of that state to the Confederacy. The considerations that brought him across the Potomac kept him there, if McClellan should attack and could be defeated, all the promising maneuvers Lee had projected at Frederick might still be executed, whereas retreat would restore the morale of the Army of the Potomac and would carry the war back into the strife-swept counties of Virginia, ever nearer and nearer to Richmond. So, on the 16th, Lee waited. When the sun was at its highest, dust along the road from the Potomac heralded the approach of a column. A little after 12 o'clock, Jackson and Walker rode up to headquarters and reported that their troops were behind them en route to Sharpsburg. Lee shook the hands of the two generals and congratulated them on the outcome of the operations at Harper's Ferry. With their aid, he said, he felt he could hold his ground until the arrival of the three missing divisions of A. P. Hill, R. H. Anderson, and McClaws, which he expected to come up during the day. Jackson's troops, on arrival, were directed to the left. Walker's men, who had marched behind Jackson, were given some rest and, at 4 p.m. received instructions to move before light the next morning and to occupy the extreme right of the Confederate position. The artillery had been active most of the forenoon. As Lee had gone through Sharpsburg, unconscious of danger and leading Traveler by the bridle, he had cautioned passing gunners not to waste their ammunition in an idle duel with the Federal batteries but to save it for the infantry, which was crossing the Antietam out of range and was massing opposite the Confederate left. About sundown, the Union artillery quickened its fire on that part of the front. Soon there came to Lee's ears the rattle of musketry and the shouts of engaging troops. The enemy was attacking, but as his advance was against Hood's veteran division, which had never yielded ground, Lee probably felt no concern. The attack ended with darkness and left the opposing wings about where they had stood when it commenced. At headquarters, during the evening, Lee waited in vain for the arrival of the three divisions that Jackson had left on the south side of the river. Their absence began to be serious, for everything indicated that the enemy would attack the next day. It would be a difficult matter to hold off the whole of the Army of the Potomac if three divisions were missing. A hurried message was dispatched to A. P. Hill to hurry forward with all speed. Soon Stuart rode up for orders and was sent to the Confederate left, where the ground seemed to offer some opening for a possible counterstroke. Hood came, also, with a report that his men had received only half a ration of beef in three days. They were exhausted, he said and should be relieved from the front line in order to they might rest and cook rations. Lee was sensitive to their distress, but in the absence of A. P. Hill, Anderson, and McClaws, he had to admit to Hood that he did not have a division to put in his place. He could only suggest that Hood go to Jackson and ask if he could send part of a division to man the front Hood had occupied. Hood went and found Jackson willing to help him but so conscious of the odds the army would have to face on the morrow that he exacted a promise from Hood to bring his troops back into line if Jackson needed them in the morning. At ten o'clock Hood's men slipped silently to the rear and Lawton and Trimble of Ewell's division moved into their places. 
A gentle rain was falling then, but the tired veterans would have slept on in spite of it had not a nervous picket firing swept often and loudly all the long, dark lines that lay across the hills. It was a brief last night of earth for hundreds of the soldiers, such a night as the army had not known since the Field of Seven Pines. Always before, the Greycoats had expected to attack, now they must stand on the defensive. Odds they had always faced, and with confidence, this time, the odds were appalling. Both because of straggling and because of the arrival of the enemy before the whole army had been reconcentrated, they numbered less than 25,000, artillery and cavalry included. 24 brigades faced 44, with strong Federal reserves close at hand. Even if all the troops engaged in the Harper's Ferry operations could be brought up, Lee would have less than 40,000 with which to face twice that number. The bivouac of this ghost of an army was just to the east of a road that starts at the Potomac and runs northward to Sharpsburg and thence in the same direction toward Hagerstown. The road is roughly parallel to the Antietam on the east and to the Potomac on the west, it defends the hills around Sharpsburg from an attack across the Antietam and covers the crossings of the river. From the highway, rounded ridges go down to the Potomac. The ravines among them are not generally precipitous, but they were to have a singular influence on the action that was soon to open. For these ridges and ravines segmented the battlefield so completely that men on the right could not see what was happening on the center, nor those on the center all that occurred on the left. The Antietam, in fact, offered not one battleground, but three, on each of which, ere another day passed, the dead were to lie in hecatombs. Beginning at a point about a mile and a half south of the town, the right extended to the road that runs from Boonesboro to Sharpsburg. With a small cavalry force on the flank, the southern end of this part of the front, which was strongly defended by hills overlooking the creek, was to be occupied at daylight by J. G. Walker's division of 3,200. On his left, extending as far as the boonesboro sharpsburg road, already was D. R. Jones's division of Longstreet's command, only 2,430 effectives, well supported by artillery. Flanking the boonesboro sharpsburg road on either side was Evans, with his own and G. T. Anderson's brigades, some 2,600 men. North of the road from Boonesboro to Sharpsburg was a strong artillery force on high ground, and then D. H. Hill's division, reduced by straggling and by losses at South Mountain to hardly more than 3,000 men. Its line extended irregularly northward from the road for slightly more than a mile and a quarter. Most of the division was on a little farm road subsequently bearing the sinister name of Bloody Lane. The left brigade of D. H. Hill under General Ripley was about a quarter of a mile south of a grove known after the battle as the East Wood. Hill's line faced slightly east of north and had in support the admirable artillery of Stephen D. Lee in a fine position just southeast of a whitewashed Dunker church that was a landmark on the sharpsburg Hagerstown Road. Opposite the East Wood, in advance of Ripley, was Lawton's Scratch Command, consisting of his own and Trimble's brigades. The front held by these units bent sharply to the westward opposite the eastward, so that Lawton's brigade faced almost due north. Beyond Lawton's left was Jackson's old division under Brigadier General J. R. Jones, plus Early's brigade of Lawton's division. On J. R. Jones's left was Stewart's cavalry, with its artillery. The distance from Lawton's right, where it covered Ripley, to the extreme left flank of the infantry was about three-quarters of a mile. Approximately 5,000 infantry were on the sector, and beyond them about 3,000 cavalry, with Hood's 2,400 infantry in immediate reserve. This was not a heavy concentration, but it was the best that Lee could present, despite the fact that McClellan had incautiously, almost ostentatiously, massed troops in that quarter during the afternoon of the 16th as if to advertise his intention of attacking there. Lee had no breastworks on any part of his line. About 50 batteries, slightly more than 200 guns and 3,000 men, were on the field, though some of them were in exposed positions where they could not cope with the heavier metal of the enemy. Except for Hood's division, which was subject to call by Jackson at any time, no reserves were at hand and none could be expected until McClaws and R. H. Anderson arrived in advance of A. P. Hill. They were expected hourly, but when would they come up? Chapter 27 The Bloodiest Day of the War Sharpsburg. It was still black night on September 17 when the sporadic fire of the skirmish lines far off on the Confederate left broke into the steady rattle of an approaching general engagement. 
At his headquarters, Lee must have heard the sound with some satisfaction, for it meant that McClellan was about to attack where the two best combat divisions of the Army, Jackson's and Hood's, had been placed. Still, with three divisions not yet reported from Harper's Ferry, the dangers of a prolonged battle begun at daylight were apparent, and the possibilities of an enforced retreat were not to be burked. Lee accordingly took the precaution, at 4.30 a.m., of warning General Pendleton, who had moved his batteries across the Potomac, to guard well the fords with part of the reserve artillery. The rest was ordered up. Fortunately, two General J. B. Kershaw rode up about daylight and reported that McClaws and R. H. Anderson, after a slow and straggling march from Harper's Ferry, were approaching Sharpsburg. The heavy fire of the skirmishers was taken up by the artillery as soon as it was light enough for the guns to be sighted. Not only on the Confederate left, but from the Federal positions across Antietam Creek, as well, the 20-pounder parrots of the enemy answered quickly. Soon the volleys echoed down the Hagerstown Road. By six o'clock news began to filter back to headquarters. Soon thereafter, at the point where the Confederate left crossed the Hagerstown Road, about a mile and a half north of Sharpsburg, a powerful Federal force, later identified as Hooker's Corps, struck furiously. Lawton's brigade was wrecked. Trimble and Hayes, who had been moved to the east of the road, were hurled back. Jackson's old division, containing the survivors of the Valley Campaign, was swept aside. A great gap was torn in the Confederate flank between Early's brigade, supporting the cavalry on the extreme left, and D. H. Hill's line on the center. The enemy was reported to be streaming down the Hagerstown Road and through the Westwood, close to the dominating ground of the Dunker Church. Hood's division had already been called up and was advancing to meet the wave. The situation is shown on page 388. This was a threat of immediate disaster. Still, if the line could be held until McClaws and Anderson were brought up and thrown into action, the day might be retrieved. But was it possible to maintain the left of the line against such concentrated fire and such heavy assaults as were being delivered in that direction by the Federals? Lee had justified faith in the gallant infantry of Hood, who were moving into the gap or standing stubbornly on either side of it, but with the odds so heavy and the stakes so great they must have help, and speedily. Whence could it come? Only from the right, where thus far there had been nothing more serious than skirmishing and artillery exchanges. At any time, the Federals might open an attack there. But in war, all risks are relative. It was far better to take the chance of having the right assailed than of having the left broken. So, before 7.30 Lee sent orders to Colonel G. T. Anderson, commanding a brigade on the Boonesboro Road, east of Sharpsburg, to march at once to support Hood. About an hour later, he directed General J. G. Walker to take the two brigades of his division to Jackson. This meant that he was to employ 13 of his 24 brigades and most of his cavalry on about one mile of his four and a half miles of front. On the right flank, he left only seven brigades to defend about one and a half miles, with one of these brigades, that of General Toombs, to defend the important crossing at the lower bridge over the Antietam. The center of the line, held by D. H. Hill's 3000, was already engaged and in the air on its left. To state these facts is to measure the emergency. Anderson and Walker moved promptly, but as their strength was small and the danger great, Lee promptly ordered McClaws, who was now resting his men near the town, to start to the sector through which the enemy had broken. R. H. Anderson, with his small division, was sent to strengthen D. H. Hill. In short, all the reserves that had come up were promptly moved into action, with no assurance that they would stem the tide. To see the situation for himself, Lee rode to the left, profoundly concerned for the safety of that flank. On the way he met his cousin, Captain T. H. Carter of the artillery. He directed him to move his battery and such other artillery as he could collect to defend the ridge about three-quarters of a mile northwest of Sharpsburg, in the hope that this would keep the enemy from turning the left even if the troops he was now moving up could not halt the Federals' advance. It probably was at this time, when his nerves were tense, that Lee met a straggler who, in some fashion, had found and killed a pig which he was carrying to his camp. Straggling, in Lee's mind, was largely responsible for the plight of the army, and at the sight of the man, his wrath rose. He completely lost grip of himself for a moment and sternly ordered that the soldier be sent to Jackson with orders to have him shot as a warning to the army. 
Almost as quickly as he lost his temper, Lee recovered it. As he rode on toward the firing, Colonel Stephen D. Lee, who had been fighting magnificently with his battalion of reserve artillery near the Dunker Church, reported from General Hood. The Texans and Law's brigade, he said, had plunged into the gap created by Hooker's attack. By the fiercest of fighting they had driven back the Federals almost to the point where the battle had opened. D. H. Hill had given gallant support by moving up his brigades from the right, and early, with some fragments of Jackson's men, held the line on the left of the gap. At the moment of their farthest advance, a second Federal onslaught had been made with an overwhelming force of fresh troops. Hood's ammunition had been exhausted, and his weary men had been forced to give ground. The left of D. H. Hill's division had been heavily engaged. The gap had been opened a second time as far as the Dunker Church. Walker had then gone in, G. T. Anderson had reinforced E. H. Hill, the line had been restored in part and the Federals had been driven back once more from the ground they had taken. Already, however, the Federals were preparing for a third assault with troops that had not been previously employed. The left of D. H. Hill's line was being slowly pushed back and he was urgently calling for reinforcements. All this Stephen Lee reported and added that General Hood was afraid the day would be lost unless supports were sent in. The commanding general listened quietly and answered in an even voice, Don't be excited about it, Colonel, go tell General Hood to hold his ground, reinforcements are now rapidly approaching between Sharpsburg and the Ford. Soon McClaws's division, a long grey line, appeared over the hill. Then Lee rode on to post the artillery that Carter was to bring up. By this time Walker had shot his bolt. His command had swept forward into the open until it had reached a stout post and rail fence, where it had been exposed to a devastating fire of infantry and artillery. Unable to cross the fence, the men had halted and then had fallen slowly back. It was now McClaws's turn. In the lull that came while that officer deployed his men for the third counterattack of the morning, Lee turned back from the left and rode toward the center in anticipation of an attack there. He found R. H. Anderson's division, less than 4,000 men, arriving to support D. H. Hill. Soon Hill joined Lee. Together, they rode down the line. Lee told the regimental officers that they must prepare themselves for an attack at any moment and he encouraged them as best he could. As he spoke to some of Rhodes's brigade, which had fought so admirably and had suffered so much at South Mountain, the colonel of the 6th Alabama, John B. Gordon, answered him with words as cheering as his own, These men are going to stay here, General, he said, till the sun goes down or victory is won. Ere long old Pete came up to Lee and D. H. Hill and went with them to a little eminence, whence they could see an ominous concentration on their left. Lee dismounted, and Longstreet, an unsmoked cigar in his mouth did the same thing. Hill sat astride his horse. If you insist on riding up there and drawing the fire, Longstreet banteringly said, give us a little interval so that we may not be in the line of the fire when they open upon us. Hill did not get down, but, like the other two, studied the dispositions of the enemy to the left. Presently, as Longstreet changed the field of his glasses, he noted a puff of smoke. There is a shot for you, he cried. A few seconds later the ball struck Hill's horse and carried off the forelegs of the animal. It was with some difficulty that Hill dismounted, as the horse stood shivering in anguish on his knees. Ere that shot, McClaws's troops had attacked with splendid Elon. Cobb's brigade moved at too wide an angle to the right, lost contact with the rest of the division, and joined the left of Rhodes's brigade. Semmes, on the left of McClaws, was oblique to the left by Jackson's order to support Stuart's cavalry, whose artillery under Pelham was plastering the Federal right. The brigades of Kershaw and Barksdale, sweeping splendidly forward, drove back from the woods a strong Federal force that proved to be a part of Sumner's Corps, the third corps that had been hurled against the Confederate left that day. The pursuit carried McClaws to the fence, where Walker had been halted by the enemy's fire. Their McClaws's men, too, had to stop, unable to throw down or to climb over the barrier. In a few minutes they had in turn to fall back to the edge of the Westwood. But this time they were not followed. Anything might happen where three assaults had been delivered with so much pertinacity, but for the moment it looked as if the worst were over on the left. 
but on the center, the segmented center, the intense bombardment and the massing of distant blue lines could mean only that the enemy was about to open the second battle of the day and was to assail the thin line of D.H. Hill. His left, which had held the right of the gap at the angle in the line, had already been roughly handled. Three of his five brigades had been demoralized. The brunt of the attack would have to be borne by Rhodes's and George B. Anderson's brigades, which stood in a sunken road, aptly styled thereafter the Bloody Lane, that formed a minor salient in the line, approximately one mile northeast of the town. The suspense was not long. Soon the troops of Franklin's Corps began to stream forward in heavy masses. They were met with resolution and were hurled back. Again they attacked and again met a repulse. A third assault had the same fate, thanks alike to the valor of the infantry and to the enfilading fire of some guns that Hill brought up. The attacks on the center seemed about to die away when a lieutenant colonel of Rhodes's brigade reported that a force of the enemy had worked around to a point of vantage whence it could enfilade a part of the sunken road. Rhodes at once ordered one flank drawn in, but the officer understood that this was to involve the withdrawal of the whole brigade. Before Rhodes looked up from caring for one of his aides, who had been wounded at that instant, the whole of his line retired. General G. B. Anderson held his brigade together for a short time, but he too was enfilade and fell mortally wounded. His men broke and came across the road. Soon the enemy was in hot pursuit and was within a few hundred yards of the high ground on which stood the Dunker Church. R. H. Anderson's division by this time was fighting hard and incapable of giving D. H. Hill any support. A gap yawned in the center as ominously as the one that had been made on the left earlier in the action. And there were no troops to fill it. Disaster seemed at hand, but D. H. Hill refused to admit that the day was lost. He found Boyce's battery nearby and set it firing furiously with grape and canister. Personally, Hill gathered a few men together and led them against the enemy. About 200 other soldiers, collected by a few diligent officers, were launched against the right of the Federals who were pouring into the gap. There was wild confusion for a time and then, most mysteriously, the enemy halted, though his artillery continued to pour its fire against a line that had almost disappeared. Despite this pause, a renewal of the attack on the center seemed so nearly certain of success that Lee had to undertake some movement to lessen the pressure on D. H. Hill. He had no reserves on the field, though A. P. Hill was supposed to be on a forced march from Harper's Ferry. The roar of guns from the right told of an impending attack that forbade the withdrawal of troops from that flank. He must create a diversion and the one point at which he could attack with any promise of success was on his left, where the assaults of the enemy had not been renewed. Orders were at once sent to Jackson to attempt to turn the enemy's right near the Potomac, with the assistance of Stuart, while Walker brought his Warren regiments together and renewed the offensive on the Hagerstown Road, at the point where the line bent to the left. Before Jackson could deploy, the action on the Confederate right became so heavy that Lee had to ride in that direction to see what had befallen D. R. Jones's division. That command had been holding the whole of the line south of the boonesboro sharpsburg Road, for a distance of more than a mile, since Walker and G. T. Anderson had been ordered away. The right of D. R. Jones's position, which faced a bridge and two fords across the Antietam, had been defended by three regiments of the Brigade of Robert Toombs, with the help of a few scattered companies. Toombs had placed his men close to the creek and had engaged early the Federal skirmishers and sharpshooters. After ten o'clock four attacks had been delivered on him. Fortunately for Toombs, these were directed against the bridge, the approach to which was along a road that paralleled the creek for a few hundred yards and was exposed to the fire of the southern batteries. Each time the Federals had been repulsed bloodily by the 2D and 20th Georgia regiments. Now, about one o'clock, the Federals massed opposite the fords below the bridge in such numbers that it was manifest Toombs's weary men could no longer prevent a crossing. The best that could be hoped was that they could retreat and hold the high ground west of the fords and south of Sharpsburg until a P. Hill came up. If he arrived in time, the enemy might be pressed back to the creek. If he were delayed, nothing could prevent the Federals from pushing forward until they got in rear of Longstreet's left. They might even sweep on until they cut off the retreat of the army to the Potomac in the vicinity of Shepherdstown. Either advance would certainly mean ruin unless Jackson meantime turned the federal right flank. 
As Lee waited in the streets of Sharpsburg, where every wall echoed the roar of the guns, Captain Thomas M. Garnett, of the 5th North Carolina, Garland's Brigade, approached and asked for orders. His brigade, he said, had been driven from the center, and his regiment was badly scattered. That sounded as if the center had been broken at the same time that the right was about to give ground, but as yet there was no sign of a general retreat on D. H. Hill's front, so far as Lee could observe. He ordered Garnett to support Evans, the nearest command, in the outskirts of the town, facing the Antietam. Then he rode to an eminence west of the town, where he watched Toombs's men form with the rest of D. R. Jones's division for a last stand on the ridge to which they had by this time skillfully withdrawn. Soon, from the Confederate left, there crept the shattered wreck of a battery, two disabled guns, and one piece that seemed still serviceable. A handful of begrimed and staggering cannoneers followed the exhausted horses. The captain of the battery, with a few of his men, came up to Lee for instructions. The officer in command proved to be Captain W. T. Pogue, in whose battery Bob Lee was serving. The boy himself was among the survivors. Lee listened to Pogue and then ordered him to take the remaining gun and the best horses and return to Jackson's front to share in the offensive that Stonewall was preparing. General, said Robert, as Pogue turned to go, are you going to send us in again? Yes, my son, he answered, you all must do what you can to help drive these people back. It was now nearly two o'clock. No new attack had been delivered against the Confederate left since McClaws had fallen back. On the center, D. H. Hill's shattered line was making a grisly bluff to conceal the weakness of the front. Longstreet's staff, finding a battery whose gunners had been decimated, were serving two of the pieces themselves, while Old Pete looked after their horses. Colonel Chilton, who was sent forward to ascertain the state of affairs, brought back the astonishing report that Longstreet said he was holding a stretch of the line with two guns and one regiment, and the regiment did not have a cartridge. As a matter of fact, the survivors of Cobb's brigade and two stout-hearted regiments were still in position, the 27th North Carolina, Colonel John R. Cook, and the 3D Arkansas, Captain John W. Reedy. When word was sent to Cook that he must keep his position at any cost, he grimly told the staff officer that his command was still ready to lick this whole damn outfit, language that General Lee would not have approved, however much he would have applauded the sentiment. Cook continued to wave his flag, Longstreet's amateur cannoneers kept their two guns hot, other nearby artillery added its fire. Such a day of suspense and instant danger Lee had never known, and now, while the September sun seemed to stand still at the bidding of a northern Joshua, crisis piled on crisis. Jackson reported that the enemy's guns so completely commanded the Confederate left that he could not turn the Federal right. Lee's immediate hope of a counterstroke vanished at the word. He had only one recourse, the concentration of all available artillery, to hold the Federals in check. As he found batteries, he had them put in action on the right, firing over the heads of the Confederates and into the ranks of the enemy, who, by this time, had brought across the creek some guns that were supporting the Union left with vigor. Against such odds as now faced Longstreet's right, even the stubborn spirit of the Army of Northern Virginia could not stand much longer. The strongest were near collapse. Men walked like ghosts and fought like automatons. In many brigades ammunition was exhausted, and the soldier had to supply himself from the cartridge boxes of the fallen. Caissons were well-nigh empty. Regiments were commanded by captains, brigades by junior colonels. Divisions were confused. The smoke-filled streets of the little town were crowded with agonized wounded and with bewildered refugees. Still the concentration against the Confederate right grew, still the Federals hammered at the center. An army that had never known defeat was perilously close to it. Then, at 2.30, when the very seconds seemed to be ticking doom, from the south a group of officers rode up at the gallop on frothing horses. A. P. Hill had come at last. Starting from Harper's Ferry at 7.30, only an hour after he had received Lee's order to move to Sharpsburg with the utmost speed, Hill had covered 17 miles in seven hours by pushing his troops to the utmost limit of their endurance. He had only 3,000 men and they were an hour and more behind him, panting on the road. They would arrive, but would they be too late? The roar of the Federal guns seemed to give an ominous answer. Half an hour passed. The situation grew tenser. 
Then, at three o'clock, the threatened attack on the right broke in fury. Up the hill came the Federals, disdainful of losses. Onto the confused ranks of D. R. Jones's division they fought their way. The southern lines bent and shifted and almost broke as the weary men slowly gave ground. Everything now depended on the speed with which the four brigades of A. P. Hill could reach the field and go into action. Until they could form, D. R. Jones's men must fight as best they could, and their artillery must dispute the Federals' advance. A retreat would be fatal, but was it inevitable? Had the left thrice closed the gap at the angle in the line, at desperate cost, to have the right doubled up? Along the front of McClaws and down to D. H. Hill's position a new attack was sweeping, bitterly contested by the survivors of Hill's regiments with the support of R. H. Anderson and of Hood, who was called back into the line for the third time that day. The field was close to chaos, the enemy was perilously near a victory. In the thickest of the action Lee at one time thought the Federals had the whole of Sharpsburg. Steadily the Northerners advanced, stubbornly for an hour the Confederates resisted. The approximate situation along the front about four o'clock is shown on page 399. The concentration against the Confederate right was overwhelming. It could only be a matter of minutes before the line must break. As Lee watched the columns that were plunging toward D. R. Jones's little division under a pall of smoke, a section of the Rowan artillery passed by on its way to the front. Noticing that its commander, Lt. John A. Ramsey, had a telescope, Lee pointed to a distant column and asked, What troops are those? Ramsey offered him the glass. Can't use it, Lee said, holding up his still bandaged fingers. The lieutenant focused the telescope, they are flying the United States flag. Lee pointed to the right, where another line was now visible. He repeated his question, a fateful question, for the troops at which he looked were where they could flank Jones quickly. Ramsey looked, looked for an instant that must have seemed an aeon. They are flying the Virginia and Confederate flags, he reported. Lee did not move a muscle, though the words spelled salvation. It is a P. Hill from Harper's Ferry, he said quietly, and, with no other word of explanation, he hastened to tell Ramsey to open on the enemy he had first sighted. General Lee, said Ramsey, as soon as we fire, we will draw the enemy's fire. Never mind me, the general answered. The first shot of the battery exploded in the Federal ranks. Soon the column halted and then got out of range. Well done, said Lee. Elevate your guns and continue to fire until those troops, and he pointed again to Hill's vanguard, which was almost at right angles to the Federals, come near your line of fire. Then change your position to the ridge on the right of the line and fire on the troops beyond the creek. With that he rode off to witness Hill's advance. It came late, but it came with explosive power. Archer's brigade was on Hill's left as the division formed line of battle. Quickly his men were hurled against a federal column that had overrun McIntosh's battery sent to the field ahead of Hill's infantry. Raising a defiant rebel yell, Archer's troops swept forward without a halt, recovered McIntosh's guns, and continued to press the enemy. Gregg and Branch, on the right of Archer, awaited the Federal advance, repulsed it, and then followed steadily the swift retirement of the enemy. Pender was brought up from a P. Hill's extreme right, but before he could engage, the Bluecoats were surging back from the edge of the town and over the ridges to the shelter of the stream bank. Toombs and D. R. Jones joined in the pursuit, and Toombs was for pressing the advance beyond the creek. The Federal artillery continued to challenge the hills, the heavy blue columns could still be glimpsed in overmastering strength across the creek and far around to the Federal right, where D. H. Hill and R. H. Anderson and McClaws and Walker and Jackson himself were counting the army of the dead. But the enemy had enough. The fine divisions of Burnside's corps, for he it was who made the attack on the Confederate right from across the bridge that has since borne his name, were content to find such cover as they could away from the avenging rifles of a P. Hill's infantry. Shining as red as if it reflected the blood on the Maryland hills, the September sun set at last, and the battle was abruptly over, within an hour and a half after a P. Hill's division had gone into action. 3,000 men, only 2,000 of whom had been engaged in the final counterstroke, had saved Lee's army from almost certain destruction. 
As quick darkness fell on the ghastly ridges, Lee found that he had fought three battles, one on each of the three segments into which the field was divided by nature. Hooker had attacked Lawton's and the Stonewall Division on the Confederate left and had first opened the gap, Hood had closed it by had withdrawn before Mansfield's assault, Walker had arrived in time to drive Mansfield off, only to find himself hurled back to the Dunker Church by Sumner, then McClaws had charged and had ended the first battle. Sumner's attack, extending down the line of D. H. Hill, had opened the second battle of the day and had been followed by the repeated assaults of Franklin's corps. Before Franklin had worn himself out, Burnside had attacked on the Confederate right at the bridge and the third engagement had opened. Each of the three battles had taken heavy toll. The dead were everywhere. The lanterns of the ambulance corps on both sides were soon flickering like the fireflies on a southern river, but they did not reach all the corners of the fields or penetrate the shadows in the woods and under the rocks where the dead stiffened and the wounded cried in vain for water. Of the 36,000 infantry or thereabouts that Lee had in action from sunrise to nightfall, more than 10,000 were casualties. Some units had been almost wiped out. The dead included two of Lee's general officers, L.O.B. Branch and William E. Stark. A third, G. B. Anderson, was mortally wounded. Grievous as the losses had been, and desperately as the outcome had hinged, time after time, on the arrival of Lee's scant reinforcements, what could the morrow hold except disaster more nearly complete? Every division was in line, in all northern Virginia there were no troops except Thomas's brigade at Harper's Ferry that could possibly be called upon, even in the direct emergency. Another series of attacks like those that had been delivered all day would certainly drive the army into the Potomac. So, at least, thought nearly all the officers who made their way during the evening to the headquarters Lee had established in an open field west of the town. Jackson came, and both the Hills, and Hood and Early and D. R. Jones. Lee walked among them and got their reports of losses and weakness, but he was calm and as nearly cheerful as a man could be with almost a third of his army dead on the field or tortured with wounds. Not one word did he say of the thing that was uppermost in the minds of most of his officers, a retreat that night across the Potomac. Where is Longstreet? Lee asked anxiously, after he had conversed with each of the others. I saw him at sundown, all right, said Major Venable. At that moment old Pete rode up. He had stopped in Sharpsburg to render what help he could to a group of ladies whose home was on fire, and he still had his unsmoked cigar in his mouth. Lee walked over to him as Longstreet dismounted. Ah, he said grasping his hand, here is Longstreet, here is my old war horse. And he began a conversation in a low tone. When the last of the reports had been received, Lee concluded that an offensive was out of the question the next day, but he was confident that the army could and would defend its position if McClellan again attacked. Artillery was to be placed to cover the bridge across which Burnside had attacked, rations were to be cooked and delivered to the men who slept on their arms almost where the battle had opened, guards were to be sent back to collect stragglers between the lines and the Potomac. After all this had been arranged without a touch of the theatrical, the division commanders were allowed to return to their troops, some of them frankly amazed at Lee's daring. What manner of man was he who would elect after that doubtful battle against vast odds to stand for another day with his back to the river? Chapter 28, Sharpsburg in Review The seemly silence of a vast cemetery lay over the green ridges on the morning of September 18. The Confederate line had been drawn in about 200 yards on the center, elsewhere it remained where it stood at the close of the battle. Numerous stragglers had come up during the night. For the first time in days, meat and bread were eaten in reasonable abundance by all. Nowhere on the long front did the enemy stir. Reconnaissance showed that he had massed his artillery on the east bank of the Antietam, as if expecting an attack. Encouraged by this, Lee ordered another examination of the left, to see if it would be possible to break through the enveloping lines on that flank and to resume maneuver. He rode there himself to prepare for the move, but to his manifest disappointment, Jackson had to confess that the enemy's guns were too strongly posted. Deprived of his only hope of a turning movement, Lee was still confident that he could resist successfully a federal attack and he waited expectantly. Noon brought no action by an enemy whose front had been aflame ere daybreak on the 17th. Most of the wounded had been evacuated. The spirit of the men was reviving somewhat. 
Still, the strength of the army was too low for Lee to consider an immediate offensive on so shallow a field. Every sign indicated the early arrival of very substantial federal reinforcements to take the place of the fallen. If Lee could not attack where he stood, and if the enemy would not do so till fresh troops came up, it was the policy of prudence for the army to retire across the Potomac and to choose some new line of advance for a continuance of the campaign of maneuver. So, at two o'clock, Lee notified Longstreet of his intention to withdraw that night. He began quiet preparations without repining. For there were other fords and other roads, surely, by which he could re-enter Maryland as soon as he was ready for new adventures there. The day ended as quietly as it had opened and witnessed no challenge of the Confederate position. After midnight of the 18th to 19th, Longstreet led the way over the Potomac and formed line of battle on the right flank. Stuart crossed with part of the cavalry at Shepherdstown and advanced up the Potomac in order to return into Maryland again and vex the federal flank if the retirement of the army was contested. Fitz Lee was to remain and to cover the temporary retreat. Steadily through the night and into the morning of the 19th the gray columns passed back into Virginia at the fort a mile and a quarter below Shepherdstown. Lee himself took post at the crossing to give directions to the Teamsters, and when Walker's division was over and its commander reported that only his wagons with his wounded and a single battery of artillery remained behind, Lee voiced an audible thank God. Not so reverent were the men. When going northward, they had sung my Maryland. Now, to quote one who waded the river, all was quiet on that point. Occasionally some fellow would strike that tune, and you would then hear the echo, damn my Maryland. Safely on Virginia's soil again, Lee had only to fear a strong and vigorous pursuit by the Federals. They attacked Fitz Lee on the morning of the 19th as he guarded the rear and they might attempt to force a crossing. To guard against this possibility, Lee directed General Pendleton to cover with his reserve artillery the ford by which the army had passed. To support the guns, Lee left Pendleton two infantry brigades, which, however, numbered only 600 bayonets. The remainder of the tired army moved a short distance back from the river and spread itself out on the hills to rest from its battles. Darkness on the 19th found Lee and his staff bivouacked under an apple tree, supperless, but fed with the promise of long-desired silence. About midnight, Lee was awakened by an urgent visitor, none other than General Pendleton, whom he had left at the ford. That bewildered officer had a startling tale to tell. The Federals, he said, had silently crossed the river above the point he was guarding. His infantry support had been driven back and, and all the guns of the reserve artillery had been captured. All? asked Lee in amazement. Yes, General, I fear all. One of Lee's officers, awakened by the conversation, heard Pendleton's confession and was so outraged that he sprang up and ran off to conceal his feelings. And well he might. To permit the enemy to cross the river unhindered and capture all the reserve artillery, some forty guns, was to threaten Virginia with new invasion and the army with ruin. Lee was, of course, much disturbed, but he said little, and as it was futile to attempt a counterattack in the dark, he decided to do nothing until daylight. When Jackson heard the news he showed more anxiety than he had ever exhibited during the war. He rode back at dawn to the ford to supervise the operations of a P. Hill, whom he directed to move up those and drive the enemy into the river. Lee sent him two anxious messages during the morning of the 20th and was immensely relieved when Jackson characteristically answered his second note, with the blessing of Providence, they will soon be driven back. He was as good as his word. Hill's men attacked with the vigor they had shown at Sharpsburg and forced the enemy to abandon the south bank. Some 200 were captured, many were drowned in attempting to recross, and the Virginia side of the stream was clear again. Instead of capturing the whole of the reserve artillery, as Pendleton and his alarm had feared, the Federals had taken only four pieces. McClellan made no further attempt to pursue the Southern Army. Lee withdrew his command on September 20 to the vicinity of Martinsburg in order to maneuver to the westward, to pass over the Potomac again at Williamsport, to move on to Hagerstown, and to defeat McClellan. If that could not be done, his plan was to occupy the enemy on the frontier and, should the occasion require, to enter the Shenandoah Valley. But it could not be. Even with stragglers who had come up, he had only 36,418 infantry present for duty on September 22. 
absentees were scattered through a wide country. Thousands had no shoes, no blankets, and scarcely any garments. Lee called vigorously for clothing and footgear and urged stern measures against straggling, but for the time his initiative was paralyzed. He had to forego all his plans for further maneuver in Maryland in order to collect stragglers and refit the ragged faithful. What might be termed the Maryland phase of the campaign, it should not be regarded as a campaign in itself, was at an end. Judged by comparative losses, Lee had given a good account of the men entrusted to him. He sustained a total of 13,609 casualties during the whole of the Maryland operation. The Federals lost in killed, wounded, and prisoners, including the Harpers Ferry and Martinsburg garrisons, 27,767. A commander who disposes in 13 days of enemy forces exceeding 50% of his entire army is not usually charged with failure. The 73 guns and the 13,000 small arms captured at the ferry were rich prizes. The 11,000 prisoners, duly exchanged, compensated for Lee's losses. He was not pleased, of course, at having to leave Maryland, but he was gratified at what the army had achieved, and in time he became prouder of Sharpsburg than of any other battle he directed, because, as he believed, his men there faced the heaviest odds they ever encountered. History, he wrote Mr. Davis, records but few examples of a greater amount of labor and fighting than has been done by this army during the present campaign. In his congratulatory orders to the troops, issued on October 2, he praised the indomitable courage the army has displayed in battle and its cheerful endurance of privation and hardship on the march. The letters of one of his aides, Major Walter H. Taylor, contain a more detailed appraisal of the results and reflect the spirit of the command immediately after the return to Virginia. Don't let any of your friends sing my Maryland, Taylor wrote, not my Western Maryland anyhow. Harper's Ferry, Taylor went on, was compensation for all the trouble they had experienced. The fight of the 17th, he said, has taught us the value of our men, who can, even when weary with constant marching and fighting, and when on short rations, contend with and resist three times their own numbers. We do not claim a victory. It was not decisive enough for that. If either had the advantage, it certainly was with us. Congress must provide for reinforcing us, and then we will be enabled to realize their sanguine expectation. Give us the men and then talk about invading Pennsylvania. Our present army is not equal to the task, in my opinion. You see, the Federals get 3,000 or 4,000 new troops a day, and though we have done wonders, we can't perform miracles. Although this was fair judgment, by no means all historians have confirmed it. The three weeks covered by the Maryland expedition have been the most criticized of Lee's entire military career. His strategy in invading Maryland has been assailed, his division of the army for the capture of Harper's Ferry has been condemned as rash and unsoldierly, his dispatch of Longstreet to Hagerstown instead of keeping him with D. H. Hill on the march westward from Frederick has been held responsible for failure at Boonesboro, his decision to accept battle on the 17th, and, still more, his determination not to leave Maryland the night after the battle have been said to exhibit an infirmity of judgment he disclosed at no other time. When biography becomes defense, it descends to special pleading and forfeits all confidence. The facts must speak for themselves. The duty of the biographer is discharged when he has arrayed them in their proper place and order. The informed reader who follows the successive steps of Lee's planning must himself be the judge of the fairness of these criticisms, but the reader, at the same time, must examine all the circumstances in their relation to the desperate leadership of a desperate cause. If this be done, the unsuccessful outcome of the operations in Maryland will be found to hinge upon the unexpected rapidity and assurance of the federal movements on and after September 13. A Union army that had suffered demoralization at 2nd Manassas and was now under a commander who was deliberation incarnate suddenly began to march swiftly on Lee. A new McClellan seemed to emerge, a McClellan who divined the movements of his opponent. Lee did not understand this at the time and did not know the explanation until the publication of McClellan's official report. Then he learned that at Frederick, on the 13th, McClellan had received from the hands of a soldier, who had picked it up in the streets, a package of three cigars, wrapped in a headquarters copy of Special Orders No. 191, covering the movement to Harper's Ferry and the march of all the units of the army. 
This information had dissipated the fog of war, had galvanized McClellan and had made it possible for him to advance in full knowledge of where Lee was and of what Lee intended to do. If the Maryland operations be hypothetically reconstructed on the assumption that McClellan had not received a copy of these orders, the division of the army for the capture of Harper's Ferry appears as a move that the fast-marching Army of Northern Virginia was justified in making when the slow McClellan was on the eastern side of the mountains and had hardly ventured from the Washington defenses. It was not that Lee was reckless, but that McClellan was lucky. To justify this criticism of dispersion of force it is necessary, therefore, to argue a fundamental that Lee subsequently expressed, namely, it is proper for us to expect, the enemy, to do what he ought to do. In other words, Lee can be condemned only on the assumption that he should have assumed that McClellan would discover the Confederate army was divided. While Lee, then, is not reasonably censurable for detaching part of his troops to capture Harper's Ferry, he may be criticized for venturing into Maryland without reducing that post. He likewise erred in his logistics in that he underestimated by two days the time required to force the capitulation of the town. Still again, he made a mistake, if a very natural mistake, in dispatching Longstreet to Hagerstown while D. H. Hill was left at Boonesboro. This final division of force was made on mistaken information that Federals were marching southward from Pennsylvania toward Hagerstown. Lee, of course, should have investigated this report and should have had cavalry at hand for that purpose. Small as was his mounted force, he should have had enough of it in advance to have ascertained the falsity of the report without having to send off infantry. He had made a like mistake in separating himself from his cavalry, though with less serious results, when he moved Longstreet to Groveton the previous month. Turning now from those criticisms that concern the dispersal of force, it is necessary to inquire to what extent Lee was responsible for the straggling of his army, responsible, that is, in the sense that he might have prevented this loss of strength. No student can read of Sharpsburg and not have a shock when he learns that an army which numbered 53,000 just before it entered Maryland mustered less than 40,000 in the critical hour of combat, though it had not sustained heavy battle losses during the preliminaries. Lee himself was conscious of failure here, for he told Alexander, my army is ruined by straggling. There had never before been anything like it in the Army of Northern Virginia, and it never was repeated until the very end of the war. There can be no sort of doubt that Lee underestimated the exhaustion of his army after 2nd Manassas. That is, in reality, the major criticism of the Maryland operation, he carried worn-out men across the Potomac. As for the specific reasons for excessive straggling, these have already been given in part. Many soldiers fell out from weariness and some because they were unwilling to invade the North, being concerned only with the defense of their own homes. At bottom, the greater part of the straggling was due to bad shoes and good roads. The footgear of many of the men had been worn thin by their stern, fast marching from the Rapidan to the Potomac. The hard Maryland roads completed the ruin of their shoes, slowed down their marching, and cut their feet horribly. Surgeon S. G. Welch, who examined many of the men after their return to Virginia, bore witness to the suffering sustained by men who were accustomed to soft dirt roads. Straggling diminished as soon as the men's feet healed, and in the next phase of the campaign it was scarcely mentioned. There remain but two criticisms to review. The first is that Lee should not have stood at Sharpsburg, but should have withdrawn to Virginia from South Mountain. The reasons that have been assigned in these pages for Lee's decision to fight at Sharpsburg are the only answer that can be made, perhaps all that need be made, to this contention. The second and final criticism is that, if Lee was justified at all in fighting at Sharpsburg, he should have retreated on the night of September 17 and should not have remained north of the Potomac on the 18th. This overlooks important facts. Lee needed time to secure the booty at Harper's Ferry, needed time to evacuate his wounded, and time to collect his stragglers. He could have done none of these things if he had retreated with an exhausted army on the night of the 17th, believing that he could repulse McClellan's attacks the next day, he was willing to give battle to restore his army, to save his booty, and to care for his prisoners. The result vindicated his decision. On the positive side, the Maryland phase of the campaign of maneuver was important in the development of the army and in the training of its commanders. The operations demonstrated, in the first place, the fine quality of the Army of Northern Virginia in defensive fighting, with which it had previously had little or no experience, except that acquired by Jackson's command at 2nd Manassas. 
Li had felt that he could usually count on the army to capture a position, Sharpsburg satisfied him that he could always rely on it to hold one. The staff and the division commanders, in the second place, learned other new lessons in cooperation at Sharpsburg. In a few reports there were complaints that supports did not arrive or that troops on the flank did not do their part, but far more often even the ambitious generals, jealous of the fame of their own commands, paid tribute in their reports to the units in the line that gave them assistance. To read the official narratives of the seven days and to follow these with a close scrutiny of the official narratives of Sharpsburg is to marvel at the progress the army made during a little more than three months in welding itself into an effective weapon. No longer could it be called a congeries of regiments. At 2nd Manassas the artillery had given a far better account of itself than in the swamps and thickets along the Chickahominy and the James. At Sharpsburg, the artillery was much criticized by D. H. Hill, and some of the gun positions were faulty and exposed, but many of the batteries had shared to the fullest the losses and laurels of the infantry. This was the more to their credit because, from the Confederate side, Sharpsburg was rightly styled an artillerist's hell. The southern guns, well served, were outranged along the whole front by the heavier, rifled metal of the Federals. The 20- and 24-pounder Parrot guns redeemed many a federal mistake on that red field, so much so that when Lee was back in Virginia, one of his first appeals to the Ordnance Department was to prepare ammunition and forward four 24-pounder Parrots captured at Harper's Ferry. At the same time he directed that two-thirds of future issues of ammunition should be for the long-range or rifled guns. Valor was not enough, the army could only stand on its guns. This was the third lesson learned at Sharpsburg. Perhaps the greatest development of the Maryland operations was in Lee himself. He did not abandon his view that the chief duty of the commanding general was performed when he brought the troops into position on the field of battle. He continued to leave the tactical details of action to the brigade and division commanders. But in the emergency of the day at Sharpsburg, when every general had been occupied on his own front, the larger tactical direction of the action had fallen to Lee and had discharged it flawlessly. Walker had been moved from the right to the left at precisely the right moment, McClaws had been directed to that part of the line where he was most needed, R. H. Anderson had been at hand to support D. H. Hill when that officer's own division had been shattered, A. P. Hill had been sent to precisely the place where his timely arrival, and only his arrival, could save the day. In a word, Sharpsburg was the first major battle that Lee had completely directed, and if he had ever believed, deep in his own heart, that his ability as a tactician was less than his skill as a strategist, Sharpsburg must have given him new confidence. For that action remains a model in the full employment of a small force for a defensive battle on the inner line.